Okay, so Evelyn, uh, sorry, L. Viler, welcome, welcome. RNG stands for Random Number Generator. Thank you. I did not realize that. Okay, yeah, so I'm monitoring two chats now. Let's see who else we have here. Okay, so he popped in with that correction. Thank you. Okay, so we are now finally, finally going to play some Hero Quest. So let me close the unnecessary windows. We've got our Twitch chat, and we've got our Discord chat. So if you have a comment, if you want to contribute, if you want to join in and say something, please feel free. Um, I'll take your uh, suggestion into consideration. Um, but I'm still the one reading the book, so we'll just have to make our choices in a timely manner. So let's just, uh, there. Okay, and please tell me if there's any problems with the stream. I think we should be okay here. But yeah, cheers, Dead Gamer. Just get a swig of water. And this is live on Twitch, but if you're watching on the replay on YouTube, you get to speed it up and you get to skip right to where we were if you want to. And if you want to do the call in on, uh, if you want to do the call in on uh, uh, Discord, sorry, if you want to do the call in on Discord, I understand. That's it's a cool way to do it. So yeah, this is the book we're reading. This is my beat up copy. Okay, so when last we left the wizard, so you've been sent on this adventure, and let me just see what we've got here for you. So this is called Beyond the World's Edge, a solitary adventure for a wizard. Okay, you're a wizard of the Virid Coast in the southeastern Emerus, apprentice to the Archmage. Theodosius. One day, returning after an errand, it took you away from master, Master's Mance for several days. You found the place deserted. Skipping ahead, so he sends you this letter. He gives you a lucky bottle. He gives you a magic carpet, and off you go. So the basic rules of the adventure are pretty, pretty simple. Actually, I need to grab my dice. I'm sorry. Yeah, so you can, you can fight enemies. You've got very few body points. You've got your speed. You've got many mind points. You've got spells that you can use up as you go. And I think we ended up choosing the same types of spells that you normally get. I think instead of having... So we had... Um, we chose the Earth. So basically, so you'd have two healing. So you have heal body, rock skin, and pass the rock. Did we skip air? I think we might have skipped air. Because, yeah, Genie is cool, but um, there's that. And then Fire gives you three combats. So you've got your Fire Wrath, Ball Flame, and Courage. Again, just like the board game. It's like the game system. Uh, you've got Water Sleep, Water of Healing, Veil of Mist. And you've got the Talismans. Which Talisman did I choose? I think we chose... I'm, I'm having trouble remembering. The Talisman of Bravery adding one to your combat. So normally, your combat's pretty low. I mean, you've got your dagger. Okay, so there's your character sheet. Again, this is for Dave Morris, Screaming Spectre, Hero Quest Interactive Novel, Game Book, 92. Um, you got four body, six mind, three combat. So it'd be four. With that talisman, speed three. You can have up to four items. Uh, you got nine spells, so you could photocopy that easily enough. So you start out with the dagger, the magic carpet, the talisman of your choice, and the lucky bottle. So that's four items. And I'm just gonna have to remember. It'll come to me, but you know we're kind of fudging it a little bit just because it's an interactive novel. Okay. Yeah, okay, so I'm going to have to just remember where we were at. Uh, 
Okay, were we fighting a phantom? Sorry, folks. Let me just double check here. Because I could have started straight from the beginning. But I kind of wanted to... Because it was a long adventure. Oh, I see. Hmm. Okay, I found a spot where we can come back to. <laughs> Sorry, folks. I should have been more prepared. Uh, so what we have here is uh, page 53. Let's go back there. So glancing down as you extricate yourself from a particularly troublesome knot of webbing. So you've landed in the forest after you crossed the, the void with your magic carpet. And, uh, you know, you couldn't believe it, but you were traveling into an uncharted part of the world. You land in the forest. You've got this uh, sticky webbing everywhere. And so um, your eyes happen to fall in the lucky bottle which was given to you, uh, hanging at your belt. Its rounded surface gives you a slightly distorted reflection. You smile at the sight of your own comical image. Then jump with a thrill of alarm. For a moment, it seemed as though something large, black, and hairy was illuminated and a shaft of sunlight above you. From the glimpse you got, it had a horrid abundance of legs, and it was descending rapidly towards your back. To dodge out of the way, you must roll equal to or less than your speed score on one dice. One die. You can, of course, use Swift Wind if you have it, so you have to make this roll succeed automatically. Well, we don't have it. But you must decide whether or not you're using the spell before you roll the dice. If you succeed in the roll, turn to 78. If you fail, turn to 66. Okay, so once again, our speed stats are 3. We don't have the spell, so we've got to roll equal to or less than 3. So let me just grab my dice here. Be right back. I'm sorry. Thought I had them with me, but um, actually I didn't because I had my other stuff put out for the other game. So let me just grab my dice real quick. Be right back. Thank you for everyone's patience. Welcome to HeroQuest fans. All right, welcome once again to HeroQuest fans. We are doing an interactive reading of the Screaming Spectre, and I tried to start in the middle of the adventure and kind of forgot some of the things that we were doing here. So we need um, a D6. So uh, just a six out of die, but I chose these. These like these from my collection of bootleg uh, Dungeons & Dragons dice. Yeah, these are not D&D &D dice. I think you had the 20-sided, the 10, 8 the four, the six, and that was it. Because, uh, But there's like a 12, a 20, a 30, a 60 in here as well. So yeah, we'll just uh, get those dice out for fun. But yeah, we really only need the D6. So, okay. So no, uh, no dice rolling cup this time. We're just going to roll. Ah, I can turn my other camera on here. All right, so we just got to roll a three or less. Five. Okay, well, we failed the roll. So I have a feeling we're going to have to fight this uh, skeleton. Skeleton. We're going to fight the spider. Could be a skeleton. No, we don't want to be a skeleton. All right, so if you fail, turn to page 66, or paragraph 66, rather. Actually, let's put it right there. There we go. 
some stuff to look at while you're waiting. Okay, so we've got 66, paragraph 66. Yeah, because this book is, I mean, the first part is a narrative, and then there's uh, like a choose-your-own-adventure style game book, and there's also a hero quest adventure tucked into there. The Adder Cob, a spider the size of a wolf, lands on you with a soft thud. You feel the rasping of coarse bristles as its mandibles close on your unprotected flesh. Adder Cob. Combat rating is 4. Body is 3. The creature's bite can be fatal. Each time it wounds you, roll a dice. On a roll of six, you are killed instantly. Fleeing is out of the question with your feet snared by strands of cobweb. So I think when we played this, we actually did defeat it. So I could skip the battle, but I do want to show you the battle for fun. So we're assuming that we've got four body still, and we've got four combat. So actually, it's, it's equal. So we have... Yeah, it jumped on us first, so I guess it has the advantage. So we're going to say it gets to attack first, unfortunately for us. If we get killed, we'll just, re we'll just retry it, because we're just starting. I just didn't want to start from the very beginning, because there's a lot. But you can check out the previous stream if you want to read, or just get your own copy of the book here. It's free online. Dave Morris made it, made it available free, which is really cool of him. All right, just checking the chat. Okay. Thank you, Elvira, for Elvira, Elvira. Thank you for the tip. So we're uh, playing here, HeroQuest fans. Okay. So we're fighting the Adder Cob. This uh, monster spider, giant spider. So it gets the first attack on us. Okay, it scored a two, so that's um, that's an attack on us. And let me just double check the combat. So is that an automatic hit, or do we get to defend? Because our combat is four right now, because we've got the uh, the talisman of courage. Talisman of Bravery adds one point to combat. Okay, we have the option to parry. But that's done instead of attacking. You must have a weapon in order to parry. Well, but you have to start. You have to decide first. Okay. So... Okay, if you have a combat score of 4, then you'll need to hit 1 to 4 on the dice to hit your foe. Okay, so they did hit us, because they got a 2. If you succeed in scoring a hit, this inflicts a loss of 1 body point. The enemy will also get a chance to strike. Okay, well, let's, let's just say that this time we do get a chance to parry. So let's try to parry. You need to roll 1 or 2 on the dice. Monsters never get to parry. So, okay, so um, they attacked us. We're going to try to parry. The Adder Cobb is three body. All right, we scored a three. So we did not we did not actually get to parry. Okay, so the wizard is down to three body points. Now, we could use magic, potentially, in the battle. And I think that might be a good thing to do. So instead of attacking, you can use magic, use a spell. All right, I'm just checking. When a spell is cast, cross off the list. It can't be used again. It doesn't say you can't use magic. So all right, let's let's uh, let's use. Probably you should use some fire. Fire of Wrath inflicts two body points of damage, and they don't get to defend. So boom, blasted in with flames. So now the Adder Cob, the giant spider, is down to one body point. So blasted him. Okay, 
So now it's our turn. Or no, that was our turn. Okay, so the monster attacks. Gets a four. So it's equal to or less than his combat. So he hits us. Um, and we didn't say we were defending, so I guess we lose one body point. So now we're down to two. Okay. This is this is tough. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm going to attack, and I want to parry the next time he attacks. So I'm attacking with my dagger. Got to roll four or less. Six. Missed. Okay. He gets to attack me. Five, so he missed, and I don't have to parry. Um, now I'm going to attack the spider. Two, so I succeeded, and I killed the adder cob. Wow. Okay. And I think the, the healing magic can be used any time. So I've got heal body from Earth, which heals four body points, which would bring us back to maximum. And I've also got water, which can't be used in the thick of battle. But, well, yeah, since the battle's over, let's use water of healing now. Because we could use heal body during combat. So, okay, so I'm now healed back up to four. So the wizard is at four body points in the adventure. All right, let's just uh, close the combat window just for now because the combat is over. All right, so we defeated the Adder Cob. So if you win, go to page 90. So we're, or I keep saying page, it's paragraph. So go to paragraph 90. Almost sobbing with disgust, you stand over the twitching carp because of the Adder Cob. Ghastly ichor oozes from its wounds and leaves a coating of slime on your dagger. With a grimace, you stagger to the edge of the glade and find some wide palm leaves with which to wipe the weapon clean. As you do this, you happen to brush a few long strands of cobweb silk from a branch. If you wound these into a coil, you could take them with you. They would count as one item for encumbrance. You could also carry one of the large leaves, which folded up would count as one item. Note that if you are taking the cobweb silk and or the palm leaf... Oh, and then turn to 102. Okay. So we've got the lucky bottle. It's one. Our dagger. Now the carpet uh, lost its power, so it's just like a regular rug. Not that big a deal. We can uh, check that if we need to, because you are limited. Unlike in the Hero Quest board game, you're limited in how much stuff you can carry. So we did use. Um, Water of healing, and we used fire of wrath up. So we've got seven magic spells left for the wizard, and we've got maximum of four items. So let's take the silk with us. Any objections to carrying the silk? We've still got the lucky bottle, we've still got the dagger. What was the other item? Oh yeah, and the talisman. So we're full. Of bravery. Alright, so we're going to 102. Sorry, folks, just checking the chat there. Okay, so 102. Following the course of a brook, you make your way onwards throughout the stiflingly hot afternoon. Hacking at creepers with your dagger, you eventually emerge from the jungle to see a landscape of lightly wooded hills descending into a broad valley. By this time, it is almost nightfall and you are very tired. You need rest before you can continue your adventure. Fortunately, there is a little wooden hut just ahead of you at the edge of the forest. As you approach the hut, you pass a stone water trough, which is fed by fresh water from the brook. If you have the lucky bottle with you, you could fill it from the trough. 
Sure, why not? Let's do that. Make a note if you decide to do that. It would still count as just one item of encumbrance. So the lucky bottle is full of water. Stepping into the hut, you see an old man sprawled on the floorboards. He gives a pitiful groan. As you bend closer in the gathering dusk, you find that his leg has been horribly mauled. The sweat of sickness soaks his clothes. Probably he fell prey to a wild animal, but somehow escaped and managed to drag himself here. You moisten his lips with a little water from the trough, or the bottle, <laughs> but he remains feverish and seems unaware of you. The only way to help him would be to use a curative spell, either water of healing or heal body. Oh man, <laughs> we'd have no healing at that point. But if you decide to do that, cross the spell off your list and turn to, turn to 14. If you decide to conserve your magic for later use, turn to 126. Well, we are a hero, right? So seems like healing the guy would be the thing to do. He might have useful information, right? So I'm inclined to say, let's heal the guy. Anybody disagree? It's okay, everybody's lurking right now. Okay, so let's, uh, let's heal the guy. So that's our other healing spell used up. So heal body is crossed off. All right, let's go to 114. Because we've got full health. Note the code word Ophelia. Ophelia. On your character sheet. Your spell miraculously cures the old man's appalling injuries. His eyelids flutter open and he sits up, clutching at your shoulder in amazement. What happened to the bajang, he says. One moment it was sinking its teeth in my leg, the next... He stares at his leg, jaw agape, and unable to fathom why it bears not so much as a scratch. Obviously, you got away from the bajang, you tell him in a soothing voice, though not knowing what a bajang is. You're safe now. Seeing the last glimmer of twilight through the window of the hut, he leaps to his feet. Safe? Not a bit of it, he cries. I've lost my pouch of salt, which means we must be very careful with the hantu when the hantu arrive, as they will surely will not. They surely will, now the sun is set. I guess he's going to be Sean Connery now. Okay. What are the Hantu, you ask him? And who are you? Come to that. Exchanging the introductions, you learn that his name is Sakai. And he is some sort of friar in this land. He seems to be full of local folklore, including the legend of the Hantu, which occupies his attention at the moment. You glean that the Hantu are ghosts that frequent out-of-the-way places and enjoy terrifying the living. The story seems almost quaint until Sakai makes it clear that the victim of a hantu is usually quite literally scared to death. On no account set foot outside the hut until dawn, cautions Sakai. Also, do not put anything over the threshold. To do so draws the attention of the hantu, and then we would both be doomed. You agree to his stipulations, just to set his mind at rest. Then, since you are both exhausted, you settle down for the night. Hours later, you awaken. The darkness outside is full of a sinister silence. For a moment, you wonder why you find it so disquieting. Then it strikes you. The silence is total. You cannot even hear the chirping of, in of insects. Except he says, chirruping. Dave Morris in his uh, vocabulary. Yeah, you can't even hear insects chirruping. Steal your nerves, then turn to three. So we traveled halfway across the world, and this is what we're seeing. Because the whole point of our quest is we're trying to meet up with uh, Theodosius. He traveled across the Great Abyss. Yep. So who knows where he's at, if he's even still alive. But we'll find out. Okay. Okay. So three, the hut is filled with a screech that makes your eyes start from your skull. It comes from the chimney. Suddenly, a hideous bone-white face appears upside down in the hearth, grinning like an open grave as it fixes you with a deathly red stare. Hard, thin fingers reach towards you. Mad giggling fills your ears. A shudder of terror threatens to numb your senses, and you press back against the flimsy wooden wall of the hut. 
You have only moments to act before the phantom lays its fearful hands upon you. If you intend to fight it out, turn to 28. If you have the code word Ophelia in your character sheet, or to 41 if you've not acquired this code word. If you prefer to rely on your sorcery, turn to 16. Okay, so are we going to match magical wits with this phantom? Or are we going to try to fight it? Hand to hand. Now you are a wizard, so... I mean, let's see. We've got some combat spells left. We've got fire, of course. We've got courage. That increases your combat score by one point for the duration of the battle. However, you're unable to flee. You must fight to the death. Ball of flame strikes all enemies facing you in a given fight. Each gets a chance to avoid damage by rolling one or two on a dice. This roll fails, a spell inflicts one body point of damage. That's it. Rock skin cast at the start of a battle. This halves the injuries you take in the course of that battle. Round fractions in your favor. Hmm. That's if they allow us to fight. I don't know. Anybody have any suggestions? Should we fight the phantom or should we try to use magic? Because, I mean, for all we know, it's got powers, too. Or we might scare it off. We do have Ophelia, so we could use the fight mechanic. I don't know. Playing as the wizard is kind of interesting because he does have these uh, skills. You know, whether you say it's magic or alchemy, you know, he's got something up his sleeve. Up his long sleeves. Anybody have any thoughts? Should we do magic or fight? Of course, the whole thing is it's trying to scare us, so it's a bully. If you stand up to the bully, maybe the bully will run away. But we don't know what we're tangling with. So, I don't know. I'm inclined to try try some magic. So let's let's we're going to put our finger there. <laughs> you know, like we did in the old days as kids, you know, playing these these books because if you just instantly fail, it's like, yeah, I'm going to go back and see what the other choice did. Rather than starting from the very beginning. Okay, we'll go to 16. Go, trying the magical route. Which of the following spells will you try? Courage or Ball of flame, of Fire? Ball of Fire? It's Ball of Flame, dudes. Yeah, there's a misprint in there. It's Ball of Flame. They say Ball of Fire. We don't have Ball of Fire, dude. Yeah, it's supposed to be Ball of Flame. But, yeah, anyway... If you, I, if you don't think either of these will be effective, your only recourse is to fight. If you have the code word Ophelia, go back. And, uh, well, we do have courage. Well, hey, the whole thing is just trying to scare us, right? So let's use courage. Anybody object? Any other thoughts? I mean, that's kind of what I was going to do anyway. So use courage and go to 54. It's trying to scare us. Well, it's got another thing coming. Okay, let's go to 54 then. Here on Hero Quest fans, anything can happen, right? Just checking the chat. So yeah, thanks, thanks everybody who joined us here today for this live reading of this Dave Morris novel. Just kind of put those out just to show you. These are these are the other books, the ones we're not reading. So, but we've got the Screaming Specter. Note the European spelling, because this is a European adventure book. <laughs> All this fancy dice that we're not using. We're just using the 1D6. Any any six sided standard six sided die will work. This just has numbers instead of pips. Pips are the little uh, dots. Alright. Okay, so 54. With nerves shored up by the spell, you are no longer intimidated by the phantom's grisly smile and haunting blood-lit gaze. It stretches out its thin arms to seize you, but it is astonished to see the look of fear vanish from your eyes. It hesitates, its mad screech turning into an uncertain giggle as it stares at you. You stare back. More than that, you laugh in its face. <laughs> this derision is more than the phantom can bear. It retreats from your laughter and is sucked like smoke up the chimney. The last you hear of it, 
as an anguished sigh as it blows away in the night wind. Yeah, take that. You better run. For the remainder of the night, the phantom, the phantoms leave your rest undisturbed. If you have the code word Ophelia on your character sheet, turn to 79. Well, that's pretty cool. I wasn't sure if that was going to work. But yeah, so you stood up to the bully and he ran away. See, a lesson for kids reading this. All right, we're going to 79. The sun radiates spectacularly, casting a glorious golden radiance over the lush river valley to the east. You go outside and breathe in grateful gulps of the fresh morning air. The scene goes a long way towards dispelling the horrors of the last night. Sakai shares a breakfast of rice cakes with you. As you get ready to set out on your quest, he thanks you for saving his life. I must, I must set, head south from here. Oh, no, that's him talking. I must head south from here, he says. But I have traveled through the country you are heading into. For I know a bit that might be useful. Should you meet the nomad barbarians of the plains, I advise you not to try stealing a horse from them, whatever else you do. You see, they consider horse theft the most heinous crime of all. Furthermore, atop a crag somewhere on these same plains lies the Academy of Mysteries. It is said that a man may become a master of sorcery there. But you must keep your wits about you, for the tuition is overseen by the great fiend himself. Sakai scratches his head. Now, is there anything I've overlooked? You're keen to be on your way. You shake hands, and wishing the old fellow farewell, you set off down into the valley. Oh, yes! Sakai calls after you. Make sure to pick some fennel if you see any. It is very good for instilling courage! The silly old duffer. There was no need to shout. You give him a last cheery wave and then turn your face to the east, whistling as you go. See, if you put in all caps, that means you're shouting. So this was uh, 1992 after all, and we were getting used to the World Wide Web, the Internet. Extreme close-up. Oh, there we go. Just trying to sharpen the image. I, I'm still getting used to this new webcam here. But yeah, so we're... Uh, Turn your face to the east, whistling as you go. Now, if you're actually looking at the old world from Warhammer Fantasy, the geography is just nonsense. And Dave Morris admitted that. And he's just like, these are the directions they gave me when I was writing the book. They kind of changed it in the middle. So whatever. But that's what he's talking about. So anyway, uh, you head to the east. So 103. I'm having fun. I hope you are too. Yeah, Dave Morris, Screaming Spectre, Hero Quest. Yeah, it's official. Maybe it's not canon, but whatever. All right, just checking the chat. Everybody's pretty quiet. They're uh, paying attention to the reading. So, okay, you walk until mid-afternoon, and then you come upon a stream. You follow this, and after a while, it joins a river. The shadows are now growing long, and the sun is dipping toward the hills behind you. You gaze along the river. There is no dwelling in sight where you might beg a night's lodging. In fact, you have seen no signs of another person all day. It looks as though you will be sleeping under the stars tonight. This prospect hardly fills you with joy. If you have the lucky bottle, turn to 128. Well, we still do. So let's go there. <laughs> I mean, I guess if you wanted to do the other thing, you could quickly like chuck it into the into the woods and say, oh yeah, let's do the other one. But let's hang on to it for now. It was a gift from our Master Theodosius, the Archimage. So let's go to 128. Deciding to fill your lucky bottle from the river again, you scramble down the bank and stoop beside the clear water. Almost immediately, jump up again. Surely that was a cry for help you heard. It came from upstream just around the bend in the river. Okay, I'm starting to remember some of this. I think we did do some of this stuff last time, so forgive me for the retread, but it's been a while. So this will be refreshing your memory as well. Okay. Sounds like a cry for help. Could be a trick. If you decide to investigate, go to 139. If you simply fill your lucky bottle, it will still count as one only one encumbrance item, and then go on your way, turn to 115. So what does everybody say? I mean, you're a hero, right? Are we ever going to get to our destination if we keep stopping to help people? 
But then again, maybe that's the life of a hero. You know, it's not about the destination. It's about the journey. Well, what do you think? Should we answer the call? I mean, technically, the last time we've already filled up the bottle. I mean, unless, you know, you've been sipping on it all this time. Might not even, might not even be necessary. We filled it from the trough. Anybody, any thoughts? What we should do? Should we just keep filling up the bottle or should we uh, answer the call for what might be a cry for help? Oh, yeah. Welcome to W43RT3R Water. Welcome to HeroQuest fans. Yeah, we're reading um, HeroQuest novel, The Screaming Spectre by Dave Morris. We're just making a choice here. Okay, well, since nobody really has a strong opinion about this, we're going to go ahead and just make a choice. I'm going to say, as a hero, you're going to answer the call. So you're going to find out who's screaming for help. And if we need to smack them around with some magic, I guess we will. So just for the record, we have used up Courage, Heal Body, Fire of Wrath, and uh, Water of Healing. And we have the Lucky Bottle full of water. We have a dagger. We have a silk webbing, which we got from a giant spider that we killed. We got a talisman of bravery, which gives us one extra combat. I mean, and full uh, four body points. Okay. Around the bend in the river, you see a waterfall. In front of it, a woman is standing knee deep in the water and struggling with a bizarre creature. It is an unnatural monster of spume and river reeds. Powerful arms muscled like giant salmon. Like a swamp monster. You get a glimpse of silvery fins and a dull pisking gaze or maybe like an abomination from the remake which wouldn't come out for two decades after this was written a tongue in the form of an eel licks the wet pebbles that are its teeth the woman staggers back and falls with a splash the creature is upon her before she can recover trying to pin her and force her under the water she fights back ferociously but you see that she is unarmed and is weakening under its onslaught you do not need to wait for a lesson in chivalry Brandishing your dagger, you give a lusty roar and charge forward to do battle with the monster. But evidently, it has no taste for a fair fight. Fixing you with its gimlet eyes, it retreats, dropping away into the river like a collapsing wave. <laughs> yes, uh, we'll get there eventually. There are only so many pages in the book. That's true. That's true. Now, there was a series of... Um, I mean, I call them choose your own adventures, but they're really called game books. I mean, that was just one brand that was popular in the 80s when I was young. But uh, it was called Time Machine. And in Time Machine, if you took the wrong path, like there were certain rules you had to follow. Like if you killed anything in the past, it would goof things up. Or if you scared somebody by leaping in time at the wrong time, you would actually get trapped in time. So you would actually get to like a page loop where you just keep reading the same pages over and over and you'd start to realize, wait a minute, I'm stuck in time. But I don't believe that that's a mechanic Dave Morris used in any of his books. So, yeah, eventually we will get to the end. So, anyway. Okay. You help the woman to her feet. Once she has got her breath back, she says, uh, May God bless you for your intervention. It was foolish for me to bathe here, so close to the waterfall, since I have been warned often enough about the river elemental. It is all you can do to hear her over the constant roar of the waterfall. <laughs> That's said to be the sound of the elemental's rage, she remarks when she sees you cup your hand to your ears. In which case, he'll be doubly loud tonight, having been thwarted. If you ask if she'll pull you... Oh, if you ask if she'll put you up for the night, turn to 42. If you prefer to take your leave of her and find shelter elsewhere, turn to 115. Well, he didn't seem very tough last time. I mean... We could stick around and protect her, but for how long? Or we could just continue on our journey. I mean, I don't know. Hey, Strange Bus, welcome. So we're doing uh, doing some live reading of HeroQuest here, these uh, game books. So we just uh, scared off a, a water elemental who's attacking this woman. And she's like, hey, you know, you can spend the night here. Um, or you could just go on your adventure because really you were sent on a mission originally and you answer the uh, cry for help. 
I kind of feel like, I mean, we scared away a phantom earlier with courage. And it's like a lot of these monsters, they're just bullies. They're just intimidating the local peasantry. They're trying to scare people. And you show up. What does a hero do? A hero inspires the people. So he says, hey, if you stand up to these guys, you know, they're not so tough, right? Most of them. So it's like you're empowering the people. So maybe that's maybe that's what a hero's role is to do, rather than to stick around and just fight all their battles for them, because you've got a greater mission. So my thought is, we should take our leave and move on. But who thinks we should stay? Should we stay? I mean, you're a wizard. You're not a you're not a warrior. Yeah. So welcome to Strange Bus. He's going to be joining us tomorrow for uh, some Hero Quest action on the board. We'll be playing the Xanon Pass, possibly more depending on our time time frame. Okay. Well, my thought is. I'm feeling pretty good about leaving her and going on. Now, if she's the type who's going to get vindictive and come after us, if we don't help, I mean, maybe the whole thing was a, a ruse, right? Anything can happen. Be brave. Take the plunge. Yeah, but Strange Bus, um, what are you saying? Should we stick around in case this bad guy comes back, like ready to fight him again? Or should we just say, you've got this and move on? Because we fought the guy off once. Is he going to come back again? For all we know, he's... Uh... Stick around? Okay. Anybody else uh, have a thought? I mean, we can always read this again if we, you know, want a different ending. Okay, well, if nobody else objects, um, let's go with Strange Bus's suggestion. And if you're watching this on... Um, YouTube on the replay, you already know what we did because it's already fixed. Sorry, you can't interact, but you can always go like, no, oh, why did you guys do that? <laughs> do all the side quests more profitable. Ah, <laughs> yes. Yeah, it's like, oh, man, I got to the end, but, you know, I did all the side quests. Okay. All right. So let's uh, let's stick around for the night and see what happens. All right. Let's go to 42. Yeah, got to get the 100% completion, right? Okay. The woman, whose name is Tripidia, Tripidia, is very happy to have the chance to thank you. She leads you back to her home, a small farmhouse not far from the river. A few chickens strut around self-importantly. And there's a pig tethered around the side of the house that grunts as it snuffles in the dirt. The inside is homely but welcoming, as you might expect, with strong wooden chairs set before a wide stone hearth. Watching as you place your belongings in the corner of the room, Tripidia is intrigued by the runes engraved on your dagger. So the weapon is enchanted, she says. No doubt that explains the elemental's reluctance to face you. You try to explain the dagger's not exactly magical, but that the runes only distinguish it as an athame, a wizard's dagger. Tripidia, however, pays no attention. She turns the dagger over in her hands. If you gave me this, she says suddenly, turning on you with an entreating look, I would be safe from the river elemental. He would never dare to attack me again. You consider her request. The monster did retreat from you very rapidly. And it is entirely possible that this was because he feared the runes on your dagger. Supernatural creatures are often very wary of wizardry. Oh, that's interesting. Uh, though the truth is that these runes have no intrinsic power, the elemental's fear of them would be certainly ensure Tripidia's safety but it would leave you weaponless. You also give her a false sense of security. If you agree to let her have your dagger turn to 55, if you insist that you must hold on to it, turn to four. All right, so do we give her the placebo dagger? <laughs> or do we uh, say, no, nah, I'm going to hang on to it. So Strange Bus. I like these books, same choose your own adventure games on DOS. Kind of miss them. Yeah, so I didn't... I mean, growing up, I mean, yeah, we had a computer, but I didn't get really into computer games until a little bit later. So, yeah, I knew about these type of games. But for us, it was, yeah, if we didn't use the computer at school, you would just get these books from the library and read them. Usually you read them like a dozen times, and then you would return them, get some more. And then later in life, you know, I found like a big stash of them that I bought. And so I have all kinds 
of these books. And uh, yeah, I'd like to do more. Now, this whole idea was not mine originally. Covert Nerd on his Covert Nerd podcast, he does live readings of these. Now, it helps if you've got a big group that's already primed to give uh, suggestions. Okay, so Strange Bus says we should give her the dagger. I mean, who knows? Maybe we'll get another weapon, right? And we do have our... Um, I mean, we'll lose one combat by giving up the dagger. We won't be able to parry. But we still have the Amulet of Bravery, meaning we uh, still will attack with three. So it's not like we'll get much weaker. So anybody else think we should give her the dagger? I mean, who knows? It's like, she, it's like yeah, yeah, uh, give me that awesome dagger and I'll give you this useless broadsword. Like, uh, thank you. <laughs> we'll see. Unless they limit what the wizard can use in this one, just like Hero Quest. Because in Hero Quest, the board game, the wizard only gets like smaller weapons, gets a staff. All right, let's let's give her the dagger. There's no nobody else. All right, so uh, we'll agree to let her have the dagger. Go to 55. I mean, hey, we could charge her for it. Uh, you want to part with some gold? Of course, I guess we'd have to carry that gold too, wouldn't we? Terpidia thanks you effusively as she tucks the dagger into her, her girdle. Delete the dagger from your character sheet. And note that until you get a new weapon, you must deduct one point from your combat score. Do you have a, both a carpet and some strands of cobweb silk? If you do, turn to 68. If you have only one or neither of these items, turn to four. Well, unfortunately, I did ditch the uh, magic carpet, which had turned into just a regular rug. We have the, the uh, cobweb silk. So... Just noting that combat, see it was four and that's down to three. At least it's not two. All right, so I guess we're going to four then. Trapidia, okay. Oh, all right, this might be actually where we were last time. Okay, but a good refresher is good, right? So, let me check the chat. Okay, so what we are doing now is we're reading The Screaming Spectre from Dave Morris' Hero Quest novel, Game Book. Okay, four. While Trapidia bustles around preparing you a meal, it reminds me of uh, Lone Wolf, where you had to eat a meal or you'd lose endurance points. That was always fun. And you had to rest and you had to eat. Lone Wolf is a good series. We should do those sometime too. Even though, okay, what's the connection from Hero Quest and Lone Wolf? So one of the illustrators for Hero Quest also illustrated for the Lone Wolf novels, even though it's set in a totally different world. So it's pretty cool. All right, but anyway, this is this is Hero Quest. Okay, Trapidia bustles about preparing you a meal. You sit on the porch and watch the sun sink amid a red swath of clouds. As night closes in, the moon rises clear and full, and the stars sparkle out of the darkness. A light breeze rustles the trees, bringing the haunting notes of a harp from somewhere down the river bank. You sit and listen to the music, a melody of exquisite beauty that mingles with the moonlight, night and river scent, to create an enraptured mood. For this brief time, the cares and worries of your quest are entirely put aside. You surrender yourself to the moment. If you call Terpidia out onto the porch and ask her who the harpist is, turn to 17. If you leave her to prepare the evening meal, turn to 29. So what do you think? Should we try to find out the source of the music? It's almost like they're uh, prepping us for... Hey, Striker667, welcome. Yeah, so we're doing an interactive reading here of uh, Dave Morris, the Screaming Spectre. If anybody wants to actually talk on the stream, I mean, you don't have to, but if you go to Discord and you click on the questing talk or quest talk voice channel, you can actually join. But if you'd rather type in the chat, that's cool too. So, okay, so we hear this beautiful music. We can ask Terpidia what it is or just let her prepare the meal. It's funny because, I mean, this book would have been written for probably young boys, you know, audience. So it's kind of like, how are we, how are men and women dealing with each other? Is this romantic or is this kind of like not, is it flirty? Is it not? 
So it's kind of funny. Just imagine what the reader would be like. Girls? I don't know. <laughs> so it's like, oh, yeah, you know, you can chat about the cool music and the nice sunset. But you do have a mission. So I don't know. Should we should we ask her for an explanation for the music or just let her finish making the food? I'm thinking we should ask her. What do you think? Should we talk to her? Ask her. Okay. All right. Let's ask her. Thank you, strange bus. All right. Let's go to 17. Side quest, right? Okay. She comes out wiping her fingers on her apron and sits with you listening to the harp. When at last the music is finished, she waits until the echo of the last note has died away in the night, and then she turns to you. That is the music of the river elemental, she says. Sometimes when the mood strikes him, he creates such marvelous melodies from the sounds of the water. However, there is malice hidden within the beauty, for it is said that the elemental is a servant of chaos, and will sometimes make a gift of a magical harp to a human who agrees to work mischief. Such a magical harp has the property that all who hear it played must dance, and will continue to do so until the harpist stops, or until they drop from exhaustion. How very fortunate that the elemental's own music doesn't have that effect, you reply. It too has a drawback, despite its beauty, says Tripidia, nodding her head towards the eastern horizon. You can now see a faint glow of gold in the sky there. It is nearly dawn. You leap to your feet. How is this possible? It seems we are only listening to the harp for a few minutes, Tripidia shrugs. It distorts the sense of time. Often I have known an entire night to fleet away, hours lost, and that what seemed an all-too-brief moment, while I sat listening to the Elemental's music, but it's just the price one pays for the enjoyment of such beauty. It is all very well being philosophical, you tell her, but I have an urgent mission. It will brook no delay. Now I must set out, and without even the comfort of a good meal and night's rest. Hastily gathering your belongings, you bid Tripidia farewell, and set out on your way. Record the code word... Strom Carl. Strom Carl. On your character sheet, turn to 12. <laughs> yeah, thanks for your participation, everybody. It makes it more interesting when it's not just, just me guessing. And sometimes, you know, I kind of vaguely remember what we chose last time. And so it's like, oh, well, hmm, what should I do? But if you're telling me, it's like, all right, I'm just going to go with what you say. Okay, 12. Although warm, the day becomes increasingly overcast as gray clouds pile up from the west. You follow the course of the river as it meanders across the bottom of a broad valley. Cranes prance slowly through the rushes, goggling at you along their thin beaks. Once you are startled by a great beast larger than an ox, which rises up from wallowing in river mud to go stomping off through the undergrowth. You instantly raise your hands, ready to weave a spell, but the strange beast seems to pay no more attention to you than the flies buzzing around it. At last, you arrive at a lake, which is shrouded in thick mist. At its fringes, the lake merges into dank marshland. Where the river debouches into the lake, there is a narrow stretch of firm ground. You see a weathered old rowboat pulled up to the lake shore. And beyond that is a ferryman's hut with a barge tethered to the jetty outside. As you ponder the best route, on from here, the ferryman emerges from his hut. His gangly limbs and small pot-bellied torso remind you of a sort of a comical insect, an impression which is only strengthened by his wide eyes and purse mouth. You will not want to take that out on the lake, he says, wagging a finger as he sees you inspecting the rowboat. Why not, you ask. Apparently it has been abandoned. While not in perfect repair, it is in good enough condition for a short voyage. The ferryman shakes his head. Mist phantoms haunt the lake he asserts. My barge has been blessed by a priest, and the phantoms will leave it alone. But if they find you in that rowboat, then they will suck out your soul as surely as a man drains a whelk from its shell. You come over and look at his barge. There is indeed a talisman hanging over the prow, and though you do not recognize the specific runes, it looks authentic enough to bear out his story. How much for the crossing, you ask him. After some haggling, he sets his price at two items. If you have two items that you're willing to part with, cross them off your character sheet. If you cannot or will not pay his fee, you can either try making your way around the lake on foot, through the marsh, or else cross in the rowboat. Hmm. Okay, so we got some choices. So we can 
take this really overpriced um, ferry uh, trip. We're going to have to lose to two items. We've already lost our dagger because we gave that away. I hate to give away the lucky bottle. And I don't want to give away the talisman of bravery because that gives us more fighting ability. We've got the silk webbing. I don't know. I'm inclined to just tell the guy to take a hike. I mean, you know, maybe he's right. Maybe he's a swindler. We don't know, right? Um, if we don't go with the ferryman, we're going to have to um, make a way around the lake on foot through the marsh or cross in the rowboat. So rowboat, marsh, or pay the guy's fee. What does anybody think? Any thoughts, suggestions for our Twitch uh, viewers or Discord viewers, listeners? Row, <laughs> row, row, row your boat gently down the stream. Merrily, merrily, merrily. Life is certainly not a dream. Okay, so Striker says row. Anybody else? Any thoughts? All right, let's try rowing. Okay, so if you cross in the rowboat, that's 116. I'm going to put my finger there. Now, the old Choose Your Own Adventure books, they tended, especially the ones that were designed for younger kids, they tended to kill you off really quick. Be like, you make two choices and it's game over. <laughs> but these, you know, you get a little bit more of an adventure, but you never know. It could be a sudden death. Ignoring the ferryman's warnings, you clamber into the old rowboat and push off from the shore out on the lake the pale of fog deadens the splash of the oars so that everything is eerily quiet you press on the cold mist stinging your lungs until you hear ghastly voices come whispering across the water at once you stop rowing and throw yourself to the bottom of the boat crouching there you peek over the side to see three phantasmal figures come drifting closer out of the mist they are translucent and silvery seemingly formed out of the mist itself with distinct upper bodies but only a floating cloud of fog where their legs should be one of them turns shadowy eyes in your direction behold that boat yonder it says in a sepulchral sep sepulchral voice these are fun words to say raising its misty hand to point let us go closer, and tones another of the three. Yes, agrees the third hollowly. There may be mortal souls for us to feast on. They veer towards your boat, legless torsos skimming the water on layers of white mist. Will you cast a spell or remain in hiding? Hmm, so we got three of these phantasmal figures. They seem a little different in character than that goofy um, phantasm that we fought or that we scared off in the hut. I don't know. Do we dare tangle with them? Because really, uh, as far as our combat, let's see, we've got we've got um, ball of flame. I think that's our only attack ability left. But we could use something else. What other spells could we use? We've used up courage. We don't have the air spells, unfortunately. Just trying to think what would even be useful at this point. Because if they give us a choice, but we don't have anything. I mean, rock skin could protect us from damage. Ball of flame would be a combat. Oh, I forgot, we've got water. So we've got Veil of Mist. Ah, Veil of Mist could make us invisible. Hey, Strange Bus, welcome back. Okay, so we've got these three Wraith, Phantasm, Ghosty type characters moving by. We could either use magic or we could stay in hiding. But it sounds like they know that we're in the area and they can see the boat, so it's pretty obvious. I mean, unless they're not very intelligent. I mean, typically these, well, I guess that's undead figures that have zero mind points. These guys might have some mind. We probably can't put them to sleep. 
but yeah, I'm, I'm guessing Veil of Mist might be something. Maybe we could impress them with some fire. Or at least protect ourselves from damage. I'm inclined to say magic. Use magic. Okay. Anybody else object? All right. Use some alchemy. All right. So uh, we're going to use magic. Try a spell or, or something. So let's go to 43. Which of the spells will you cast? Ball of Flame, Veil of Mist, or Tempest? Well, we don't have Tempest, so we can't use that. If you have none of these, your only hope is the Phantoms will overlook you. Okay, so thankfully we do have Ball of Flame, and we've got Veil of Mist. I'm tempted to think Veil of Mist. Now, the only question is, them being kind of mist-like themselves, is it going to have any effect? Like, will they just see right through it? Yeah, we've got fire, but is fire going to even affect these ghostly characters? I mean, or will it just be a beacon saying, here I am? <laughs> now, you would think Tempest would actually be good. It's too bad we don't have that, because I could have just imagined, you know, you throw a bunch of wind at them and it disperses them into the air. So, I don't know, fire or mist? Which one? Anybody have a thought? Let me refer back to the magic table here. Now, these work slightly differently than in the board game, but Veil of Mist in the board game lets you pass through monsters, but the idea is it makes you partially invisible. And they try to hit you, and they can't do it because you're demist. Okay, so Striker says Mist, whereas the Fire would be... Um, you attack them with the flames and they, they can they can try to avoid the damage. Striker says missed. I'm inclined to think that too. But I guess we'll see if it if it works on these type of characters. Okay, we're going with mist. Veil of mist. You know, it's kinda of like Frodo puts on the ring, but the ring race can see him. Because they're evil too. Alright. Mist envelops you like a cape, spreading out around the boat in a swirling mass of white, of chill whiteness. Normally, uh-oh, I'm already seeing a problem here, but we'll keep on reading. I'm just going to put my bookmark there. We'll, we'll, uh, we'll be brave. Okay. Mist envelops you like a cape, uh, spreading out around the boat in a swirling mass of chill whiteness. Normally, a spell rendered... This, the spell renders you invisible to your foes. In this case, it has an even better effect. Aha! Seeing an eerily fog-draped figure ahead of them, the phantoms stare spectrally across the water, mistaking you for another of their kind. Are there mortals in this boat? inquires one, its translucent tongue dragging across bloodless lips. There was one, you reply in your best attempt at doom-laden tones. The soul was most succulent. <laughs> <laughs> yep, yep. You called it, Striker. Exactly. They think that we're one, we're one of them. Mournfully, the phantoms rise and glide silently across the water. You breathe a sigh of relief before rowing as fast as you can to the far shore. Awesome. 140. See, I was thinking, oh, they're just going to see through it. But it might work. But yeah, that's cool. It's like mimicry. So we go to 140. You make your way up out of the boggy lowland toward bordering the lake. By late afternoon, you're walking on pleasant, wind-blown downs. Ahead, as dust draws over the landscape, lies a rolling vista of copses and grassy knolls. Spying a cottage, you make your way nearer in the hope of finding shelter for the night. However, your calls of greeting are unanswered, and so it seems the place is deserted. You push the door open. Evidently, there is no one at home, but the cottage shows signs of having been lived in quite recently. Why would the owner have left? However, no danger is visible, so you decide to take the liberty of making up a bed for yourself beside the fire. Now, I wonder, are there some bowls of porridge nearby? Uh, 
just kidding. Um, in the absence of the owner, you also help yourself to some bread and butter from the larder. After supper, you feel warmed and content and can restore one body point if currently wounded. Well, we're not wounded, but that's nice. Cheers, dead gamer. Then you settle down for the night. Try to roll your mind score or less on one die. If you succeed, turn to 93. If you fail, turn to 105. Mind. We've got six mind. That's going to be pretty tough. Try to roll a six or... Oh, roll a six or less. Well, that's easy. It's impossible not to. Right? Is that, can that be right? It seems like a trick. But, I mean, we don't have any choice. Yeah, our mind is six. Okay, let's see if I can roll a six or less. Well, obviously I did. I rolled a one. Um, you didn't even see that. Yeah, I rolled a one. I mean, <laughs> there's no other numbers on here. <laughs> okay, well, whatever. Maybe maybe there's something in this game that takes your mind points down below that. Okay, so you succeed, turn to 93. Well, that's easy. Wizards have high mind points. Okay, shortly after midnight, there is a dry scraping noise. A grinning little spriggan emerges from the brickwork beneath the hearth and goes creeping on tiptoe towards your belongings. Uh-oh. It's like those uh, ice gremlins. You sit up indignantly and swipe at it. It's small, I guess. It leaps like a startled cat and scuttles back into a corner. Thorn-sharp fingers raised to fight back. Spriggan! Combat 5? Seriously, five. Uh, where, where are we? Down here. Sorry. Spring and five. Oh, it only has one body. It will mean abandon your abandoning your belongings if you flee out into the night. Turn to one seventeen if you decide to do that. If you try to decide to kill the spriggan, turn to one twenty nine. Well, this little upstart creature, it's really powerful because we've only got three combat. I don't know. Should we fight the little uh, creature? I mean, it's trying to steal our stuff. The other choice is to run. But we'll lose all our stuff. I'm saying fight. It might be a tough battle, though. The thing is, though, we could uh, blast him with Ball of Flame. <laughs> now, if we blast him with Ball of Flame, he'll have a chance to try to get out of it. I'm just wondering if there's going to be a stronger opponent later we're going to wish we had these spells to use on. But, you know, it, it, use it or lose it, right? Otherwise, we're just going to have to fight our way through. It's like one of the, you know, in the games, they always give you those annoying small little enemies that just chip away at your health. Okay. If you use Ball of Flame. Oh, yeah, Veil of Mist. we got to cross that one off. That's gone. What if we put it to sleep? Spell doesn't always work. When you decide to cast during battle, refer to list here. Okay, so just out of curiosity, we're at 93. We could make it go to sleep with magic. Then we could find its secret stash of stuff that it's been stealing. Because I don't want to lose a lot of health on this stupid little spriggan. I don't want to lose my stuff either. What do you think? Should we put it to sleep, or should we try to fight it? Magic, or... I guess we're fighting hand-to-hand, -hand because we don't even have our dagger. Put it to sleep, yep. Sleep! Alright, let's, uh, let's do that then. Thanks, Strange Bus. Okay. We're gonna use sleep on it. So that's 93. And we're going to 64. The spriggan curls up into a tangle of thorny limbs and winds its barbed tail around itself. Oh, it's got a barbed tail. Emitting a rasping purr like the sound of a cat might make. If you stuck it through a meat grinder, that is. I won't try to imitate that sound. Gingerly, you reach out and pick up the sleeping spriggan. Turn to 129. Are you going to kick it like a soccer ball? Let's see. 
because I mean you're a hero, but you're also uh, not very tolerant of these uh, nasty creatures trying to do you wrong. Holding the loathsome spiny thing by the tail, you fling it into the fire and watch it watch it crackle and shrivel like a burning pine cone. Hey, that's that's what you get for being evil. You note that Spriggans burn like a pale green with a pale green flame, producing an odor like mingled honeysuckle and charred hair. The residue resembles wax. And you can keep some of this if you wish. It counts as one item of encumbrance. Hey, at least you got something good out of him. Perhaps these details will interest your master. Ah. Might be getting close to the end here. The rest of the night passes without incident. In the morning, you rake over the ashes of the fire, gather your things, and pre prepare to set out. <laughs> okay, so we used up sleep, but we uh, gave the thing a cremation. Okay, so let's just put down this uh, waxy substance, whatever it is. Maybe your alchemist master will know what to do with it. And we've used up Veil of Mist and Sleep. I mean, the, 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 the annoying thing about playing as the wizard is like you're holding back. You're like, when do I use my magic? But if you hold back too much, it's like, I've got all these spells I should have used. Because you know? you're not a combat guy, really. All right, so we set out to 141. So it's an air freshener. Yes, good point. Good point. All those air freshener monsters. Maybe it's uh, shaped like a little green tree. And if, if cars had been invented, we you would hang it from your uh, rearview mirror. Okay, it's a blustery day, but free of rain. You find the fresh wind to be bracing rather than unpleasant and soon fall into a strong stride. Okay. Uh, sorry. The miles roll by. Before long, you're heading out across sweeping plains. There are no trees, and the wind flattens the long, dry grass. The occasional granite tor is the only feature in this desolate, flat landscape. Finally, you come in sight of a crag, at the top of which squats a building of stone walls and high black painted gables. The steeple path leads up towards it. If you go up to investigate the building, turn to 19. If you press on across the plains, turn to six. So a building of stone walls and high black painted gables. So what's our choice? Should we investigate this building or should we keep on going? I mean, it seems like when we found buildings before, it's usually like empty and there's a monster inside or there's some helpful person inside that needs our help. But how will we know when we reach our destination? We don't know. I mean, our master could be anywhere, right? What do you think? Should we check out the building, guys, or should we keep on going? I guess it's a 50-50 chance, right? I'm thinking we should probably check out the building. Anybody disagree? I'm just going to make an executive decision then if nobody has any opinion. Worst case scenario, we get killed and we just have to go back. All right, let's investigate the building. So we're going to 19. It's turning into a pretty good adventure so far. It's a longer book than the others, I've noticed. It's a hard climb, and by the time you reach the top, you are breathing heavily. Over the walls of the outer court courtyard, you see tall black towers looming against the sky. Sorry, just let me get a throat lozenge. Uh, a sign creaks on an overhanging post. You peer at it until you have made out the faded words. The Academy of Mysteries. Aha! See, that was mentioned by one of the previous characters. And it sounds like the kind of place where you might find an archimage, an alchemical sorcerer, a wizard of philosophy. Academy of Mysteries. The gates stand open for you to enter, but, clo but close of their own accord as you pass through. You watch in slight surprise as the padlock snaps shut and locks itself. Clearly there is sorcery at work here. But that is only what you expected at such a forbidding place. 
As of yet, you have no cause for alarm. You cross the courtyard to a heavy door, which opens as you approach. At first, you assume that this is more magic at work, but then a stooped old man shows himself in the doorway, huddled inside long black scholar's robes. He beckons you over. Come in, come in, he urges. It's much warmer inside. He shows you into a musty wood-paneled hall with several desks and a lectern at the far end. Here, daylight penetrates only dimly through the dusty panes. The floorboards creak anciently underfoot as you walk through the hall, studying the inscriptions painted above the narrow latticed windows. You have arrived at the Academy of Mysteries, announced the old man in a reedy voice. I am Tentrabolus, the schoolmaster. You can study here and gain great sorceress knowledge, but when you go to leave, the evil one will do his best to snatch you, and those that escape him rarely get past his gatekeeper. So choose. If you go now, you can pass unmolested. Stay, and you stake your life, a fitting price to pay in the pursuit of knowledge. If you tell... Tantrabalus, that you will attend his lesson in magic, turn to 31. If you decide to leave, turn to 7. Well, what do you think? Should we listen to this old guy give us a lesson? Give us a lecture? Stay for one of his classes? Or should we decide to leave? I'm kind of thinking here, if he's legit, maybe he'll teach us some more magic. Or maybe he's just a charlatan and it would be a waste of time. But he is giving us a warning that when you go to leave, the evil one will do his best to snatch you. So we might have to fight after we leave. But do we have a choice? If we take the class, maybe it'll help us. Hmm. I don't know. What do you guys think? Should we listen to what he has to say or should we just head out of there? I'm inclined to listen. I mean, at least we'll get a good nap if it's if it's uh, nothing useful. So, I mean, he's not the evil one, and he's tricking us. So you never know with these books, right? Could be anything. Let me just check the chat here. Or check the roster, I should say. I, I'm, I'm watching the chat. I'm trying to watch the chat a little better here. Got a good group here today. Yeah, so if you're listening on Twitch, I'm just checking to see if anybody has any suggestions. I'm inclined to listen to this Tantrabolus. And let's go to 31. And hopefully, if we have to fight, we'll be prepared. Tantrabolus fetches a number of books and goes up to the lectern, from which he holds forth, which he holds forth a great length. Must have poor eyesight. At first, you find the lesson tedious. But then you realize that he is telling you about a variety of sorcerous techniques and occult principles that you've never previously considered. You can now acquire the three spells of whichever category, fire, earth, air, or water, that you did not select at the start of the adventure. Yes. Okay. So in that case, let's get the uh, air spells. So that would be... Wow, that's, that's a lot. That's a lot of uh, help, actually. Potentially. I didn't know the old man's lecture would be so useful. So we've got if we've got the air spells, we've got Genie, Swift Wind, and what was the third one? Tempest. Okay, so we've got air now. That you did not select at the start of the adventure. You're a worthless student, I must say, says Tentrabulous once the lesson has ended. Most attentive. But no matter how hard you study, you'll most likely end up with a gravestone for a diploma. He wanders off mumbling himself, leaving you alone in the shadowy classroom. Mindful of his earlier warning, you cross the floor cautiously and then make a sudden dash for the exit. A loose floorboard suddenly opens up be beside you and a huge hairy hand thrusts up, sharp fingernails clutching to seize you. You must act quickly or be ensnared. If you want to use an item, turn to 44. If you think a spell might help, turn to 57. If you prefer to rely on your innate agility, turn to 70. Okay, so we can try to dodge out of the way, use magic, or use an item. And as far as items go, we don't have a lot of choices. We've got our lucky bottle. What good is that going to do? 
like smack the hand with it, throw water on it, just regular water. We could rub some of that waxy substance on it or <laughs> wax the floor or something. I don't know. Uh, so we've got the silk webbing and I'm trying to picture like ensnaring the arm or throwing some webbing at it. We got the talisman of bravery, but I mean, that's just what we're wearing. We don't have the dagger. Now with magic, we just, we have some new magic. So let's see what the, I'm just curious with the genie, how the genie works in this. Cause in regular hero quest, the genie is like a powerful attack. Like the genie just smacks the enemy once. Swift wind would let you move faster than you could normally. And Tempest, maybe we could ensnare the creature, whatever it is. Let's see. Genie. The genie can either restore one point that you've lost from any characteristic. Okay, so it's like healing, sort of. Inflect one body point of damage on the foe. It's not very strong. Or foretell the future. You can look at one entry option in advance before making a choice of what to do. Or you can open a door or other obstruction that you otherwise could not get through. Well, that's interesting. So we could use the genie to see what the magic would do. Or we could just say, yeah, let's use magic generically and then see what it lets us do. Okay, so we've got this, this hairy, huge hairy hand with sharp fingernails clutching from the floor to try to grab us. Anybody have any thoughts? So dodge, magic, or use item. I'm thinking either magic or dodge. I don't. We've been we've had pretty good uh, luck with the magic, and I mean it's like it's kind of like in uh, so many video games. You know, they give you a bunch of power ups, a bunch of ammo, and it's like, what's going to happen next? You're going to need to use it, right? Of course, it could be a trap. I'm thinking magic. Anybody object? Different idea? Since we've just got those three new spells. I mean, we've used up a lot of spells already, but we got three more. Might as well give it a try. All right, I'm going to make an executive decision. If nobody has a thought, I'm going to go for the magic. And I'll put my finger there in case that was just a death page. Only two spells strike you as possibly effective in this situation. Which will you use? Okay, so it says Veil of Mist, which we've already used up, or Swift Wind. If you decide against either of these, you can either try dodging past or consider the items you're carrying. I don't know. Swift Wind is, was kind of my thought earlier. It's like that'll let you move faster than fast. With blinding speed. Strange bus. <laughs> um... Should we try to use the swift wind? Okay, so if you're watching this on YouTube, you're just like, come on. <laughs> we know it's not live, so we know you're just going to make a choice anyway. All right, let's go with the swift wind. Let's see what happens. Yeah, tomorrow we're going to be playing a live Hero Quest game. I'm really excited about it. We'll have to make some slight modifications just based on who shows up, but that's okay. It should be fun. But today we're doing this Hero Quest novel. And I, I do like to finish an adventure. I hate to leave it just undone. So, okay. So on 18, with a burst of speed, you dodge away from the clutching hand and rush outside into the courtyard. Turn to 142. Okay, well, that was easy. Let's see what's at 142, though. Wait a minute. Oh, okay. All right. You stride rapidly across the courtyard, resisting the urge to look back over your shoulder. Your only wish now is to be away from this dire place as quickly as possible. You come to a halt beside the gates. Still fastened to the stout pad padlock, they bar your exit from the academy. You must resort to magic if you are ever to leave. If you use genie to unlock the gates, turn to 20, well, we do have it. If you have passed through rock to go straight through the courtyard wall, turn to 32. Well, we do have that. If you have neither of these spells, you're, you now notice the skulls scattered across against the walls of the courtyard. The mortal remains of previous visitors to the academy. Like them, you're doomed to remain a prisoner here forevermore. See, I was thinking, okay, they're going to give us a kill screen. 
but they're breaking it up over two pages. So you'd look ahead and go, oh, I'm fine, and then you turn the next page, oh, I'm dead. Well, thankfully, we do have both of those spells. So we could use the genie to unlock the gates. I mean, it's a shame to use them for that, but better than dying, right? Or we can pass through the rock. Now, I, I know with pass through rock, they always warn you in the game version, the board game version, that if you stop inside solid rock, you can be trapped forever. But according to this, it just a lot enables you to move through a solid object. So there's no downside. Sh should we unlock the magical gate or should we pass through the wall? Anybody thoughts? Pass through the wall. One is kind of like, you know, you got the wall hack, the no clip cheat code. And the other one is, oh, you unlock the gate. Because we went in and it locked behind us. We're unlocking it. I don't know. I'm almost thinking like the pass through rock. Because if the whole thing is a trap, maybe we should bypass the mechanism that they give us. Because, I mean, are they saying like, is it a test? Are they saying like, oh, well, the worthy can move on, but the unworthy die, you know, like Indiana Jones? Or is it, we don't care, we've, we've rigged it so that you won't survive? I mean, the guy, the teacher thought we were going to get killed, so I don't know. I'm think I'm I'm leaning towards pass through rock. What does everybody else think? Anybody any thoughts? One second, I just got to grab something. I will be right back. Go ahead, think about it. Pass through rock or genie to unlock the door. One, one moment. All right, welcome once again to HeroQuest fans. We're back. We're reading The Screaming Spectre by Dave Morris, HeroQuest novel, 92. Let me just check the chat, see if anybody had any thoughts on our next choice, what we should do. Pass through rock, genie. Okay, so nobody new has joined. That's okay, no answers. So I'm just going to make a decision. I'm going to say pass through rock is what we should do. We're actually getting close to the end to our, of our time together. So let's just see how things go. And we'll just face the consequences. Because it is a game. All right. So we're, we're going to pass through rock and go straight through the courtyard wall. Hopefully we don't get stuck inside solid rock. But they don't say that that's a risk in this game. So we'll see. 32. I'm going to keep my finger there just in case. All right, 32. The spell allows you to pass straight through the heavy granite blocks of the wall. It is like moving through cold water for an instant. Emerging on the other side, you notice a warrior in black armor standing beside the gate. If you had exited that way, he would certainly have ambushed you. Aha. As it is, he gives a roar of anger and stomps towards you, the metal plates of his harness clanking hollowly with each step. Seeing no benefit, in an unnecessary battle, you hurry off down the path at a pace that the warrior cannot match. Turn to six. Ah, see, they're going with the thing where the armor slows you down. It's not necessarily true, as Shadowversary would say, but, you know, in this universe, this is what it is. Okay, turn to six. So we don't have to fight this guard. So it sounds like we made the right choice. Okay, the easier choice. The plane stretches on and on. You walk until your legs ache, but still there is no end to the dreary flat landscape. Towards sunset, the sky looks like a canopy of scarlet, gold and azure green. You come to a standstill, overawed by the beauty of the strange land, by a sense of your own insignificance. Aww. Then as you stand there in the gathering dusk, the faint strains of music reach your ears. Moving towards the sound, you catch sight of the tents of a nomad encampment. The nomad's horses are tethered beside the largest tent. But there is not a single person to be seen, not even a sentry guarding their horses. Think how useful a horse would be for your journey. Wait a minute, wait a minute. I'm remembering that warning from the guy saying, hey, they treat uh, horse thievery as a capital offense. But man, a horse would be uh, useful. So think how useful a horse w 
would be for your journey. As you approach the tent, you can hear the sound of stamping feet mingle with the harp music coming from within. It sounds as though people are dancing with great gusto, great gusto, but curiously, there is no singing. An odd nomad custom, or something more sinister. If you take advantage of the absence of sentries to steal a horse, turn to 58. If you continue on your way on foot, turn to 107. If you decide to take a look inside the tent, turn to 71. All right. <laughs> yeah, um, so Elviral, Elviler, sorry, I can't get your name right. You said pass through rock, and I think you were right. And you're saying now, don't steal a horse. I'm inclined to agree with you. I mean, I'm just, I'm just picturing some like big barbarian guys. Barbarian versus wizard. I mean, could be kind of tough. I mean, yeah, there's superstitious, cowardly lot when it comes to magic. But on the other hand, there is the philosophy among them that there's no magic that can uh, withstand the bite of honest steel. So, and as far as magic, we've got, let's see, we've got tempest. We've got Ball of Flame. I think that's basically it. <laughs> Choose life. <laughs> yes. Okay, so should we look inside the tent? Because, I mean, we haven't harmed anybody yet. Or should we go away on foot? I mean, we're hearing music. It could be a raucous party inside. It could be a distraction from our quest. Let's not steal the horse, but which of the other two choices should we do? Any thoughts on that? So for our live audience for Twitch, we either continue on foot or decide to take a look inside the tent where we're hearing this music and presumably dancing, but it could be a ruse. It's almost like a test, like they're saying, hey, do you want to steal one of our horses? Do you want to party with us? Chris, now if we set off on foot and they notice us, I mean, they try to track us down, I'm sure they could catch up pretty quick. I honestly don't know. Ah, yes, they might offer you a horse. So if you party with them, you can hold your liquor. If you can dance, and assuming they don't challenge you to a fight or something, maybe you could uh, get a gift of a horse. And now you don't look that gift horse in the mouth. I like I like the way you think, Elvira. Elvira. Elviler. I'm going to say it a hundred times. I'm kidding. Elviler. Okay. So he's saying peek inside the tent. He or she, I shouldn't assume. Anybody else have a thought? Okay. So if you're watching this on uh, YouTube, obviously we've already made a choice. So let's see. Let's look inside the tent. Might as well. We're an adventurous sort. Curiosity killed the cat, but we'll see. Hopefully we're not too cat-like in this adventure. 71. Do you have the code word Stromkarl on your character sheet? Well, yes, we do. Now, just because you have a code word doesn't mean that you're going to win. There was an adventure where they gave us a code word, and it was kind of crappy. But we do have the code word. So we could go to 83. All right. I'll just put my finger there. 83. Are you carrying a quantity of burnt spriggan, a waxy residue? So that little uh, air freshener critter we threw in the fire. Why, yes, we, we are. We have collected such an item. So we can go to 80. Oh, we can trade maybe some uh, of that oily residue for a horse or something. Okay, recalling... Oh, interesting. Okay, so we're at 80 now. Recalling Trapidia's tale of magical harps, you plug your ears with a waxy residue. This is a rather revolting procedure in view of the rank smell of the stuff, but it is preferable to being ensorcelled by malevolent music. See, Dave Morris, he, he loves these words. He's like teaching the kids, you know, um, more uh, GRE words. Uh, expanding their vocabulary. Then, ears firmly stoppered, you push in aside the tent flap. Within, you see a whole, the whole tribe of nomads cavorting insanely to the strains of a harp. The harp is being played by a ferret-faced traveler in ermine robes. Oh. Maybe some type of magical uh, instairment. To judge from the look on the nomads' faces, they would like to kill the harpist if they could stop dancing long enough to reach for their weapons. Since you cannot hear a thing, you are completely unaffected by the music. In fact, 
You rather relish the look of baffled alarm in the harpist's face as you stride across the tent towards him. <laughs> Evil harpist. Uh, combat three, body one. Ah, he's not so tough. It hardly seems credible you'd wish to flee from this puny fellow. If you do, turn to 107. If you kill him, turn to 19. Okay, well, my thought is this. He's playing the harp. Is he going to like fight us with one hand while he's strumming the harp with the other? Because as soon as he stops, won't the nomads just like pounce on him? His combat is only three, which matches ours. He's only got one body. I say we fight him. Any uh, any objections? I mean, yeah, you save the tribe, get a free horse. Sounds good to me, right? All right, let's fight him. Okay, but we got to decide. Uh, we're going to use anything beforehand. We're just fighting him with our dukes, our just bare hands. We don't have a dagger, but we've got three because we're wearing the Amulet of Bravery. So we got our 1d6 for combat. So we've got to roll a three or less to fight him. We've got the drop on him, so we get the first first strike. Sometimes it just the book doesn't really tell you who attacks first, but I mean you just base it on the context. All right, so we're attacking him. Got to get three or less. Five. Okay, so we missed. Darn. Okay, well now he's going to try to attack us. He's got to get three or less. Okay, he, he failed. I guess he couldn't hit us one-handed. All right, we're attacking him. Four. We failed. He's going to attack back. Battle of the Geeks. Okay, so he got he got one. So he hit us. So now we're down to three. Uh, I should have said parry. Oh, we can't parry because we don't have a weapon. Ah, uh, darn. Okay. All right, so we're attacking him. Two. Score to hit. So he's dead. All right. So we lost one, uh, one body point, but we uh, killed the evil harpist. He had one hand tied behind his back, still playing the harp, let's assume. So we killed him. So go, go to 119. Okay, thanks, Elvira, uh for joining us. Uh, hope you have a good one. Uh, go ahead and watch the replay when you get back if you want to see how it turns out. Thanks for your participation. Okay, 119, the harpist lies dead at your feet. His music silenced forever. The nomads, now free of the spell, they kept them dancing, step forward cautiously. Their swords are in their hands. Only when you turn over the harpist's corpse to their foot, revealing the staring, sightless gaze of death, do they relax their wary postures. It is a cleaner fate than the cur deserved, growls the nomad chieftain, sheathing his sword. He came among us as guest and shared our supper, then offered to give us a tune on his harp by way of a repayment. Little did we know what an enticing melody he would play. <sighs> you shrug. An invidious fellow indeed. But he will spoil no more evenings with his music now. It is good, declares the chieftain with a nod. We thank you, and you may stay with us tonight. You sleep comfortably in one of the felt tents, protected from the chilly wind howling across the plain. In the morning, you enjoy a fine meal of spiced porridge, hey, with the nomads, and can restore one body point if wounded. Well, great. Now, so we're back to four. Fully healed to our maximum of four body points. If you still have the lucky bottle, why, yes, we do. Go to page 144. So we spent the night with the nomads, saved them from a fate, an unfortunate fate. Okay, so 144. You are getting your things together in preparation for another day's journey when the nomad chieftain comes to you. I wish to thank you once again for your help last night, he says. We are but poor people, so there is little I can give you to repay you for your trouble. You raise a hand. Thinking nothing of it. It is a matter of honor that we give you something, he insists. Therefore, I have brought you this small quantity of a liquid called aqua regia, or royal water. It was sold to us by a trader, and is an acid with the power to dissolve gold. I doubt we would ever find someone interested in buying it, but it may be useful to a scholar like yourself, who no doubt enjoys tinkering among the flasks and al alembics of a laboratory. He's got some vocabulary. 
you transfer the aqua regia to the lucky bottle. Together, liquid and bottle still count as only one item for encumbrance purposes. So I guess you swig the water that's in there or dump it out and put in the aqua regia. After thanking the chieftain, you turn to the east and head off on your way. Turn to 59. All right, so that's turning out pretty well. So we got the aqua regia inside the lucky bottle. Yeah, the lucky bottle, it was, you know, one of those message in a bottle things. It came floating across the across the ocean to you from Theodosius. And it just happened to reach you, so it was like, that's lucky. All right, so 59. So you thank the chieftain. Go on your way. See, I thought we would be close to the end, but hey, there's more adventure to come. Uh, I think if we don't get close to the end here soon, we will just kind of break it off and pick it up next time, but let's just see how we do. Only an hour after daybreak, you spy a cluster of yellow flowers in the shelter of a low bluff. It is a pleasant and cheering sight after the drab expanse of parched grass you've been trekking through for so long. You stop to pluck a few of the flowers, which you identify as fennel. Do you have the code word Ophelia on your character sheet? Why, yes, we do. So, we've got Ophelia, and we go to 108. Just checking the chat here. Seeing if anybody new joined joined us as we were talking. Yeah, thanks everybody for joining us. Okay, so we're calling old Sakai's parting words. You suddenly understand what he was telling you. Trusting to his herbalist knowledge, you chew up the fennel flowers. They have a miraculous effect. You acquire the courage spell. Ah, so it's back. Add the spell to your list. If you had it already, you can now cast it twice instead of once. So that would have been cool. Turn to 132. 132. Okay, so we've got courage back. See, this is cool. You're, you're, uh, you use your spells, but you have opportunities to get them back. Now, if you're playing the tabletop adventure game, you know you'd be every quest you'd get your magic back. But here, it's just whenever they decide to give you an opportunity. All right, at, at 132. At last, the plains come to an end, rising into barren, dusty hills. You wend your way on, following the course of a dry gully, until you see the towers of a grim citadel ahead. A pennant flies from the topmost turret, a gray flag in which seven black stars are visible. The citadel of the seven statues. Somewhere in that forbidding keep, your, mis your master lies imprisoned. Aha! Finally. Finally, the citadel of the seven statues. Your, mis your master lies imprisoned. Experiencing renewed vigor, now that you are within sight of your goal, well, we can't stop now, you march up towards the citadel. There's a growing knot of icy fury in your heart. You will deal harshly with whoever has captured your master and forced you on this arduous quest. Suddenly an arrow whispers past, whispers past you through the air. Just missing you, it clatters off a nearby rock. Dropping to a crouch, you scan the walls until you see a flurry of movement behind a narrow window to one side of the gatehouse. An archer stands there, already knocking a second shaft on his bow, ready to snipe you as you approach. If you want to run straight for the gate, turn to 24. Uh, if you prefer to advance in a zigzag rush, serpentine, turn to 34. If you decide to cast a, f a spell first, turn to 47. Hmm... Would an archer be faster than fire? Oh, strange bus. Sorry, Mr. Uh, message. I'll be back later. Thanks to the stream stars. Back and forth. Yeah. Thank you, strange bus. Um, if As you come back, uh, we'll have to join you later. But yeah, thanks for joining us for the live reading interactive uh, hero quest book story. The Screaming Spectre. Okay, so we could blast him with magic. But the question is, is he is his arrow going to be... I mean, he's already got his arrow ready to go. How quick is our spell going to be if we, like, threw ball of flame at him? You know, if we run in a serpentine pattern, it's going to be harder for him to lead us and hit us. So I'm thinking either dodge or use magic. What other magic do we have? We've got courage. That's not going to help too much. 
you know, we're at full health, but I mean, what if he gets a lucky shot? I'm just going to look at the magic we've got. I'm thinking probably the dodging is the way to way to go. So we've got Ball of Flame. We could use Rock Skin at the start of the battle, if there is a battle, of course. We've got Tempest. A localized storm that envelops enemies. Each enemy must roll dice at the start of a subsequent round, needing one to three before they're free of the Tempest. But see, that's assuming it gives us an opportunity to actually do that. See, some of the magic, it works just automatically, and some of it, you have to incorporate it into a battle. Too bad we don't have sleep anymore. All right, I'm thinking dodge. Anybody uh, have any objections to that? I'm going to put my finger there in case it's the wrong choice. Advance in a zigzagging rush. Now, we're going to have to beat the guy up with our fists because we don't have any magic, but what would an archer... Now, we might need the magic later on once we get in, because I'm sure there's more than one guard. Okay, well, I'm going to just, uh, I'm going to try the zigzag rush, and if I'm wrong, then maybe we'll give it another try. So it's 34, zigzag rush. Let's see if we get killed doing this. Your heels kick up flurries of dust from the gravel strewn path as you go racing up towards the citadel, dodging to and fro. From the vantage point of his window, the archer sees you coming. His first arrow misses, uh, sighing lethally as it strikes over your head. He takes more time with his second and third, waiting to anticipate your position before shooting. To dodge each of the remaining two arrows, you must roll okay, equal to or less than your speed score on one die. Do this for both arrows. Each, each one that hits you inflicts one body point of damage. Well, we can take the hits because we got four. If you survive, you keep going until you reach the lee of the gate. Okay. All right, so we got to dodge two arrows. So our speed, let's see what the speed is, because I don't remember. It hasn't been affected by anything. We don't have swift wind. Speed is three. So we got to roll three or less. All right, let's get our dice box back. So we got our D6, we got to roll three or less. So this is the first arrow. Let's see if it hits us, three or less. Four, ah, we got hit. Okay, so we lost one body point. We're at three again. All right, here's the second arrow, three or less. Four, <laughs> darn. Okay, so we're down to two body points, and we don't have any healing left. Now, we do have that aqua regia, but who knows what that stuff does. Maybe it's just perfume or something. All right. I have a feeling we're going to need this again, but let's just close that for now. Okay. So we took the two hits. Boom, boom. If you survive, you keep going until you reach the lee of the gate. You press yourself against the colossal oak portal, hidden from the archer's line of sight by the jutting stone portico. You slump into a crouch and get your breath back. For the moment, at least, you are safe. Or are you? Glancing up at the roof of the portico, you see a row of holes in the stonework. These are murder holes, channels through which defenders of the citadel can pour boiling oil, or most likely boiling water, <laughs> as many have pointed out. Boiling oil is just too much, but it's an old medieval movie cliche. Uh, boiling oil or acid on enemies who are at the gates. You must gain entry to the citadel quickly before the murder holes start to sluice an agonizing rain upon you. Turn to 97. Okay. All right, let's go to 97. There are only three ways of getting into the citadel. If you decide to cast the genie spell... Oh, I forgot. We... We still have the genie. We haven't used it. If you want to use Pass Through Rock, turn to 121. Well, we've used that up. Yeah, I forgot. We do have genie. If you intend to scale the Citadel walls. Well, when they give you the option to use magic, it's kind of like it's either going to be nothing or it's going to succeed. I guess that's just kind of how it always goes in games. So get into the Citadel with the genie. 
That means we still got Ball of Flame. There might be a final boss or something that we have to use it on. I'm inclined to say Genie. Because it's either Genie or Climb the Wall. But we know there's archers out there. And they could be throwing crap on top of us and shooting us with arrows. It's going to be pretty tough. I mean, if we scale the wall, we've got that webbing. That might work. But it's going to be pretty tough because there's nothing to protect ourselves with. Because we don't have Veil of Mist anymore. I'm going to say use the Genie. Anybody disagree? We're at 97. Paragraph 97. Okay. Let's use the Genie. Let's try it. See what happens. Keep you in suspense for a couple of seconds here as I find the page. Okay. A whirlwind comes screeching up through the hills. What? Did I go to the right page? Yeah, I did. Oh, yeah, the whirlwind, of course, because it's an air, air uh, skill. A whirlwind comes screeching up from the hills behind you, whipping up dust and pebbles. As it reaches you, it subsides to reveal an imposing figure. Golden rubies glitter his rich brown skin, and a turban of green silk rests on his brow. Muscles ripple as he raises his mighty arms in salam and bows to you. God be with you, O master of magic and grammarie, he intones in a booming and thunderclap of a voice. And with you, my most loyal servant, you reply. I pray you now, open these gates that bar my way. Your words are second only to the laws of heaven, O font of excellent wisdom, he replies. Bending towards the gate, he strains with every fiber of his massive strength. There is a creak. The thick oak doors bow inward under the pressure. Sweat breaks out on the genie's brow. Never have I known such a task, he says. It would challenge the king of jinn. Is it beyond your ability, you ask, anxious in case you have wasted the spell? Never, declares the genie. And mingling with the roar of his voice, you hear a loud splintering as the gates fly open. Dismissing the genie, you step forward into the citadel. Well, that was cool. Turn to 145. One forty-five. Okay, so we got the door open, smashed open. You advance cautiously across the cobbled courtyard towards the central dungeon of the D O N G J O N dungeon, like dungeon, of the citadel. A square building of drear gray stone, more closely resembling the colossal mausoleum of a king than a castle's inner tower. You pass through an archway into an empty vestibule. There is a huge door directly in front of you, emblazoned with the same armorial insignia that you saw in the pennant. Seven black stars on a gray field. The emblem of the enigmatic seven statues, whoever or whatever they might be. Your gaze travels around the vestibule, checking for possible avenues of attack. You see only a well in the floor, whose shaft probably leads to the citadel's crypts or storerooms. If you want to go over and look down the well, turn to 61. If you cross straight to the door, turn to 74. The well or the door? Hmm. Fool of a took. The question is, is the well going to be a deadly trap? How good are you at swimming? If you cross to the door... I mean, what are they going to do? I mean, there could be a monster in the well, I suppose. Are they going to swim after you? I don't know. In the movies, it's always the well. Look down. See, but it says look down the well. Cross straight to the door. The door has the seven black stars in the gray field. The enigmatic seven statue symbol. Sounds like there might be some kind of confrontation in there. Maybe stealth is the better avenue. I'm going to I'm gonna go with, let's look down the well. But I'm going to put my finger there just in case it's uh, doom. All right. Any objections, anybody in the live stream? This has been a pretty interesting little adventure. A lot of twists and turns. Let's go to six. Even though we didn't start at the very beginning this time. Watch the other stream to kind of hear where we were previously. So let's do 61. Okay, the moment you looked over the lip of the well, you're transfixed by an eerie sight. A horde of spectral bodiless heads are floating up the shaft of the wellway towards you. I don't know if I don't want to drink that water. 
each with eyes glowing like luminous emeralds, long teeth gnashing in bloodless gums, their necks end in a ragged stump from which hangs a hideous knot of writhing entrails. Ew. All this is enough to fill the bravest heart with horror. But there's something else that terrifies you most of all. The heads are rising towards you in total silence. If you want to use a spell, turn to 98. If you stand your ground ready to fight, turn to 86. Well, the thing is... We're only at two body points. If we're going to fight a bunch of these weird heads, I don't know if we can do it. I'm inclined to say a spell would be useful. Now, we've, we're have we running out of options. We've used up so many of these magics, these alchemical skills, that uh, it'd be kind of tough. We might have to fight the last bad guy, if there is one, with our bare hands, but I don't know. Got ball of flame. Anybody have any thoughts? Just check the chat here. Yeah, decisions, decisions. I'm thinking let's let's just try a spell. I mean these kind of like quasi supernatural bad guys are they less resistant to magic and it seems like we've had pretty good uh pretty good odds against them but if it fails we'll just have to fight them all right let's try it let's try to use some magic see what happens in our wizarding adventure for hero quest which of these spells will you try Ball of Flame, which we have. Tempest, which... Oh, yeah, I forgot about Tempest. We actually have Tempest. We could use that. Or Swift Wind. So Ball of Flame, they have a chance to avoid damage. They're just heads, these floating heads. we got Tempest, maybe we could blow them away. Of course, they'd have a chance to escape. And Swift Wind, we don't have. If you don't have any of these left, turn to page 86. Hmm. Let me just take a quick glance at the spell descriptions again, because again, it does vary slightly from the board game. You just kind of imagine how they would work. Swift Wind and Creep, I don't know. Tempest, localized storm. Each enemy must roll a dice at the start of their subsequent round. You need to roll one to three before they're free of the Tempest and can start attacking again. This affects all enemies in a given battle. Well, that's pretty good. Ball of Flame strikes all enemies facing you. In a given fight, each takes a chance to avoid damage by rolling one or two. So one or two versus one or three, one to three. Seems like the ball of flame has better odds for not failing. And Tempest would just be a temporary stun before they can attack again. But they could be, stay stunned for a long time. Whereas ball of flame is going to just do one body point of damage. I assume on each enemy, not just one. Yeah, because Fire of Wrath was a single enemy with two body points of damage. Ball of Flame is all enemies. One point of damage, potentially. I'm thinking Ball of Flame. Anybody have any other thoughts? The Tempest would be like a little tornado to blow the monsters away. But they could break free and then attack us. I hate to fight three monsters. Because that's three attacks. I'm going to say Ball of Flame. I'm going to put my finger there and we'll see what happens. So Ball of Flame. Going to 122. Here are the... There's my little cool bookmark from back in the day. All right. Uh, 122. All right, 122. Sorry, got distracted for a second there. Okay, 122. Your use of the spell is well judged. Closely bunched in the narrow wellway, the vampire heads can do nothing to escape the blast. The fiery mass drops down among them, carrying them back down into the bowels of the citadel crypt, even as they burn. 
Though their mouths opened as if to scream, they still emit no sound. Okay, so we torched them. Okay, so that fire spell is gone. So we've used up all the fire spells. Turn to 110. So we've got Tempest. I think Tempest is the only one we have left. We've used a lot. And still we're not at the end, but let's see. 110. You continue onwards through the door and quietly draw it closed behind you. You are in a long hall. Gone Fallons, each bearing the emblem of seven black stars, hang from the tips of lances set in brackets along the wall. They stir languidly in the drought that moves the draught that moves through the hall after you've closed the door. Dust covers every surface, including the great stone table that dominates the center of the room. Set around this table are seven stone seats, and in front of each seat is a stone goblet. At the back of the hall is a darkened archway. Off to one side in the far corner, a spiral staircase leads to the upper floors of the keep. A voice resounds from beyond the archway. Resounds from beyond the archway. It is like the rumbling of rocks. Come, brothers, it is time for our repast. Heavy footsteps shake the floor. Seven stony pairs of feet tread the flagstones. We might just have time to reach the staircase before they get here. If you run over to the staircase, turn to 11. If you conceal yourself behind a ga gone Fallon and wait for them, turn to 23. How good are you at hiding? So hide or run? Run over to the stairs. No, no, no. I'm thinking hide and hear what they have to say, but if you're going to have to fight like a bunch of wizards, that's going to be tough because you don't have any magic left. Of course, maybe they'll respect your bravery or maybe they won't. 50% hmm. chance, you know. Can Does logic work in these games? Who knows? I'm going to just take a wild guess here and just say conceal myself behind a gun, gun Fallon. So Gun Fallon apparently is some type of like tapestry or flag, I'm guessing, from what they describe it. So it might not be much concealment. Turn to 23. Okay, all right, let's try it, unless anybody objects. If we die here, we'll just have to try again some other time because I think we're running out of time here. But thanks for everybody for joining us on HeroQuest fans on Twitch. A replay will be on here on uh, Home of HeroQuest fans XSC3 on YouTube. Okay, 23. You draw the fabric of the Gonfalon across in front of you and wait for them to arrive. They loom out of the darkness beyond the arch. Seven figures of stone statues come to life. Each step they they take makes the floor shudder underfoot. Each sound they utter is like an echo in rock canyon. In a rock canyon. Where is the table? Grants the first, arms outstretched in front of him like a sleepwalker. Oh, they got rocks in their heads. As he advances slowly, a lumbering, one lumbering step at a time, you suddenly realize they're blind. It is intolerable that we should go fumbling our way to table like old dotards, intones another. It is our shirky henchman's fault, the third statue growls. He should be here. He will suffer foul torments for his laziness. The henchman. Do they mean the archer who shot at you when you arrived? No matter. Now that you know that they cannot see you, you can breathe more easily. And now, looking out more boldly from behind the gun Fallon, you see something else. The last statue wears a set of keys at his belt. If you creep past them and head up the stairs, turn to 11. If you go up to them and pretend to be the missing henchman, turn to 36. Go over and sit at the table. Turn 49. Hmm. Pretend to be the missing henchman. Now, they just said, they just said that it was the henchman's fault. And that they were going to punish him. So maybe it would not be a good idea to impersonate him. But you want to get those keys. How are you going to get the keys? Go over and sit at the table. I know, it's a big risk. It really is. Of course, they're going to wonder, if you're not the henchman, who the heck are you? I mean, you're sneaking around. Of course, if you sit down, they're going to immediately know somebody's there. They're going to wonder who you are. I don't know. Should we pretend to be the henchman? Should we just...
boldly sit at the table, or should we creep past them and head to the stairs? We don't have those keys. I mean, we don't have the genie anymore, so I bet you we're going to have to unlock the door that holds our master captive or unlock his chains or something. We'll probably need those keys. But how are we going to get them if we just sneak away? Pretend to be the henchman or sit at the table. How are they going to torment him? Uh, I don't know. It's a 50% chance. Do you pretend to be the guy that they're after? Of course, they're blind. Maybe, I don't know. They seem like they're going to, they're confident they can punish you. You know, a, a sharp-eyed henchman with his uh, bow. Let's try sitting at the table. <laughs> that may be the wrong choice. Well, we'll see. 50% chance, right? Or 33% chance Come from a highly educated university. All right, let's try 49. Okay. Oh, I didn't think of this. Oh, cool. Okay. One at a time, the statues go shuffling to their seats, but one is left standing because you've taken his place. He looks around with the sightless stone orbs of his eyes. Where is my chair? He growls. A stranger may be sitting among us, thunders the one next to him. It doesn't occur to them to try counting the chairs. Probably you wouldn't be too clever either if you had a lump of rock for a brain. Finally, the one at the head of the table comes up with an idea, however. We will join hands. That way it will soon become obvious if there is an intruder in our midst. They all nod slowly as the merit of their plan penetrates their marble skulls. The statues, on either side of you, thrust out their hands. You must think fast or be discovered. If you have the spell Rock Skin, which we never used, but we've still got it. We've got Rock Skin, we've got Courage, and we used a ball of flame. So yeah, I guess we do have more spells than I thought. Because, I mean, it, if we didn't use them, then we've still got them. So rock skin. We've got it, so I guess we'll turn to turn to rock. Or the resemblance of rock and blend right in. Ah, that's, a, that's a cool use of the spell. Okay, turn to 62. All right, let's do it. 62. By virtue of the spell, your hands feel... Your own hands feel just like theirs. No, there was no one here but us, intones the leader. Then my chair is missing, declares the statue who is still standing up. Find that indolent henchman, says one of the others ponderously. He will suffer a thousand deaths if he has failed in his duties. The statue whose chair you have taken stares blindly across the table. And in the meantime, am I to stand? Take your seat, brother, you say. Forcing a baritone rumble into your voice, I shall take the keys and go looking for our negligent henchmen. There's a general murmur of agreement, yeah, 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 sounding rather like a landslide in a quarry. Give him a solid drubbing, leader tells you. Pound him until he screams. Grind his bones to powder, cries the seventh statue, pouring himself a goblet of fine silt and draining it with apparent relish. I shall see to it that he never shirks in his duties again. You call back as you stride over to the spiral staircase. Note on your character sheet that you have a bunch of keys. And turn to 11. Okay, uh, yeah, so we used up the waxy substance. I guess it's still in our ears, or maybe we took it out. We must have taken it out, because after the incident with the nomads. So we've got keys. So just for the record, we've got the lucky bottle full of the aqua regia, or royal water. Second item, we've got the keys. Third item, we've got the silk webbing from the spider. Fourth item, we've got the talisman of bravery. No weapon. And we just used up rock skin. We've got two body points left. All right. So turn to 11. 11. Yeah, I'm looking forward to tomorrow's game. So hopefully everything goes well and we can do that. If our plans change, we'll just pick it up some other time, but hopefully it'll all work out. 11. The stairs take you far into the citadel. The only sounds in the narrow stairwell are your breathing and the scuffling of your boots on the stone steps. Suddenly you pause. Your master must lie somewhere close at hand. You can sense it, but it seems strange that there's no guardian to prevent intruders reaching this far. Do you have the code word immolate? 
No, we don't. I've not written down this code word. See, when would we have had an opportunity? We never got that one. So maybe there was something we should have done to get that code word. That doesn't mean that we've lost, but we might have lost. You know, explore every side quest as uh, as we were warned earlier by one of our alert viewers. Okay, well, we don't have it, so we got to go to 99. If, it, if that's the end, then that's the end. But let's see. 99. Your suspicions are confirmed a moment later when a hideous hunchback appears around the newel of the stairway and launches himself at you with an enraged snarl. Sounds like he's got the initiative. Hunchback. So there's combat. Combat three, just like you, and body of two, just like us. Ooh. It would be dangerous to turn and flee. He could just leap down at you. If you defeat him, you can t continue up the stairs by turning to 111. Okay, well, this might be it. I mean, he's pound for pound, move for move. He's the same as we are. He's got the advantage. But do we have any magic we could use on him? Because they always give you the option to throw a spell, if you've got one, at him. Okay. So we don't have sleep anymore. We've used that up. Water feelings used up. Veil of Mist is used up. Ball Flames used up. Fire Wrath is used up. We've still got Courage. That increases your combat score by one for the duration of the battle. However, you will then be unable to flee. Well, they said it was a bad idea to flee anyway. Well, actually, they don't even let you. Okay. And see, if you flee, they get a free hit on you. That's the other thing. So we could boost ourselves up. We've Pastor Rock's been used up. Rock Skin's been used up. Heal Body's been used up. Genie's been used up. Swift Wind's been used up. Tempest's been used up. So our only choice is Courage. Let's use the Courage. This was the Courage, that the extra Courage that we got. So now our combat score is going to be 4. We don't have a weapon to parry. All right, so he's got combat of three. We've got combat of four. So he's got to get a three or less to hit us. So let's uh, bring our combat window back up with our D6. He's got to get three or less to hit us. Oh, he got a score to three. Okay, so we're down to one. Uh-oh. This could be the end. All right, we're attacking him. we got to get four or less. Three, we hit him. Okay, he's down to one body point. So one versus one. He gets to attack now. This could be at three or less. Oh, he hit us. We're dead. What did the Aqua Regia do? I just don't even know. Um, it's a shame. If you defeat him. Well, we're so close. We're so close. It's too bad. That'd be the event, end of the adventure. You know what? Does anybody have a quarter? <laughs> we want to give it a second try. Let's start the combat over. So we're going to do a mulligan here. Normally I wouldn't do this. I'd say that's the end of the adventure. We'll have to try again next time. Keep coming back for more. But I'm really curious to see the end. And when am I going to get another chance to read this? So let's just rewind the clock. He's got three combat, two body. We've got four combat and two body because we'd used our courage. He's attacking first. Can't parry. We can't flee. He's got to get three or less. Six. So he failed. So already we're doing better. It's just a simple roll of the die. So we're going to try to attack him back. Four or less. We failed. Okay. He's attacking. Four. He failed. We're attacking. Six. We failed. He's attacking. Six. He failed. <laughs> We're attacking. Four. Okay. So we scored a hit on him. So he's down to one. He's attacking. Hunchback attacks. Hunchback attack. Okay. He scored a hit on us. So now we're down to one. All right. This is it. We're attacking him. Three. We, we defeated him. 
So see, it's just just uh, roll the dice. So the, we would have died, but since I gave us all a mulligan on it, we're just going to go ahead and say we beat him. Killed the hunchback. So, yeah, it could have gone either way. So 111. At the top of the stairs is a door. You glance over your shoulder only to find that the stairs have vanished behind you. There's just a circular shaft leading far down to the ground floor of the Citadel. There's no turning back now. Who's there? cries a voice from the other side of the door. It is your master, Theodosius. At last you have found him. You try the handle and discover the door to be locked. The cell is lined with silver, calls Theodosius from the other side of the door. That means you cannot get in with Pastor Rock. Well, that's interesting. If the walls are lined with silver, it doesn't work. If you have a bunch of keys, then you can unlock the door. Or you could use the genie spell if you have it. Well, we don't have genie spell. We do have the keys. If you can get the door open, turn to 37. If you have neither the spell, the item, nor the spell you need, then your adventure ends here. You came within a whisker of saving your master, but in the end you failed him. Now you cannot even save yourself. Well, thankfully we do have the keys. So again, if we hadn't failed um, our rolls, I mean, it's tough when the monster starts first. But uh, yeah, we would have uh, made it. Okay. We don't have pass through rock, but we do have the keys. So if you can get the door open, turn to 37. So if you just want to read the ending, that's that's your shortcut. Bursting into Theodosius' cell, you see at once that there is one final guardian to deal with. Oh, man. It is a mechanical hound fashioned out of interlocking plates of burnished gold. Behind it, Theodosius sits with his wrists fettered by iron shackles. Thank heavens you've come, he cries, but beware this strange beast. The metal hound makes no attempt to bite you, however and instead jumps back across the cell and clamps its jaws around Theodosius' throat. As you step closer, it emits a, mechanic, a menacing mechanical growl. This is a sticky situation. If you try to free your master, those golden fangs will rip out his throat. What can you do? If you were given some aqua regia by the nomads and wish to use it, turn to 50. Well, we do have that. If you wish to try a tempest spell, which unfortunately we do not have, you have neither of these 76. Okay, well... Aqua Regia, Royal Water. Would that, like, screw up the gears on the creature? This mechanical clockwork monster? Well, it's our only choice. It's either that or just let it hold him prisoner. I mean, is is the, is the creature ordered to kill him? Or to keep him alive at all costs? It's threatening him. Let's try the Aqua Regia. So, if this fails, we're going to lose our master. Fumbling for the lucky bottle, you accidentally drop it. Oh, no. Theodosius utters an exasperated gasp. Oh, you clumsy oaf. The bottle shatters on the stone floor. And the aqua regia splashes onto the mechanical hound, which gives a startled yelp as its metal hide begins to dissolve. Enraged, it forgets all about Theodosius and launches itself at you with whirring of gears. If you were without a dagger, you'll be pleased to learn that the broken bottle will serve perfectly well as a weapon. Aha! So you've got a broken bottle. So now we're back to... Oh yeah. Courage wore off. So we had just had three. We've got a weapon, now we're at four. War Dog. That's what it's called. Combat three, body five. Oh man. We're down to one body point. The Aqua Regia is still dissolving the War Dog, and it will automatically lose one body point each round, whether you hit it or not. Everything rests on this battle. If you win, turn to 88. Well, it looks like it's attacking us first. Man, that's not good. So it's got a score of three or less. One combat die. I have a feeling we're going to die here, but... Um... Okay, so it's going to attack first, and it's losing one body. The thing is, it's going to be dead eventually, whether we, no matter what. And we unlock the door. Now our master's still chained up. Could he escape with without our help? Like if we get killed, who knows? Of course, he's still got to get past the stone guardians. But who knows what it, tricks he's got up his sleeve? Okay, so it's attacking us. It's got to get three or less. Five, it failed. Okay. So it loses one body point, so it's at four. 
<laughs> four, and we're at one. So now we're attacking it, and we've got a weapon again, so we can parry. So I'm going to say every attack we're going to try to parry, okay? We're going to try to parry every one of its attacks. We didn't need to parry that one because it failed. So we're attacking it with, it's, so it's got to be four or less, two. Okay, so now we hit it, so it's down to three. It's every round it loses one. Okay, so it's attacking us. It's got to get the war dog. Not a warthog, a war dog. I lost my place. What? Oh, no, there it is. Okay, war dog. Yeah, it's got the combat of three. Okay. Yeah, so it lost one. It's attacking us. Three. Uh, it killed us. We're dead. Darn. Okay, well, <laughs> anybody got another quarter? All right, we'll start over from the combat. Okay, so it attacks first. It's got a combat of three, body of five. We've got one body point left. It takes damage every time. So it's got a score three or less. So it's attacking us. One. Okay, well, it would have killed us again. Let's count up the deaths. So we got two deaths so far. It would have lost one body, but that doesn't matter. Okay, starting over again. Third try. It attacks first. Gets a six. It fails. So it loses one body, so it's down to four. We've got one. So we're attacking. we got to get four or less. Six. We failed. So it's attacking us. Oh, I forgot to parry. I forgot to parry. Okay, so we don't have to restart the combat. Cancel, cancel. Okay, so we only died once. No, we didn't die, because the first time... Okay, let me let me backtrack. So it's at three body points. We forgot to parry. So to parry, let me just check the parrying rules. I apologize, folks. I'm getting a little tired. I need to get uh, get a meal and get a little break here. We've been going for quite a while here. It's been fun though. Thanks for tuning in to HeroQuest fans for this live interactive reading. Parrying. Beyond the World's Edge is the name of this adventure. Okay, to parry, get out of a weapon, which we do. Roll one or two. Okay, so this would save us from dying in the very first battle. Okay, so it's down to three. We're down to one. Got to roll a one or two. Okay, well, we would have failed. Okay, so that would be the first death. Okay, so we restart the combat. It attacks first. It's got to roll... The war dog has to roll three or less. Five. It failed. We're attacking it. Got to get four or less. Three. So we damaged it. So it's down to... So that was the first combat. So it's down to four. And we scored a hit. So it's actually down to three now. So three body points for that and one for us. It's going to attack and we're going to parry. It's attacking. It's got to get three or less. Four. It failed. Don't have to parry. We're attacking it. Four. We hit. So it's down to two. And it loses... Ah, does it lose it per round? Yeah, it's down to two. It's attacking us. It's got to get three or less. Ah. Whoops. Drop the die. <laughs> okay. Okay, it's attacking us. Five, it failed. We don't have to parry. We're going to attack it, and if we hit it, we're going to destroy it because it's going to lose one body anyway from the acid, from the aqua regia that's dissolving it as we speak. One, we hit it, boom, doing one damage, down to one, and... It gets dissolved, so it's destroyed. Okay, so it only took us two tries to kill the war dog. I forgot about the parrying. I mean, you got to remember, it's like forgetting to roll defense. You're just like, oh, I got killed. It's like, nope, you can parry. 
All right, so the war dog. Oh, where was our spot there? See, I had my finger there, but I, I was so excited. We fought a lot of battles in this game. Come on, where is that? All right, sorry about that. Okay, so we were at 50, paragraph 50. All right, the Aqua Regia is still dissolving the War Dog and will automatically lose one body point each round, whether it's hit or not. Everything rests on this battle. If you win, turn to 88. So 88, let's see if this is the end. Yeah, see, I never read this book back in the day, so it's not like I know how it ends. I didn't cheat by reading ahead. With a final clanking of gears, the metal dog slumps to the floor and lies still. Well done, says Theodosius. Now, you'd better get these blasted chains off me and we'll quit this place without delay. Do you have a bunch of keys? Well, of course. If so, turn to 148. We absolutely do. All right, so we're turning to 148, paragraph, Screaming Specter. You unfasten the chains. Rubbing the circulation back into his wrists, Theodosius gets to his feet. You've done rather well, he says with a smile. Well enough, I think, to deserve this. He takes a document from his belt and hands it to you. Drawing himself up to his full majesty, he begins to mutter an incantation, a teleportation spell. Master, you say, wait for me. He waves his hand in dismissal. Surely you know this particular teleportation spell will only take one person. You'll have to find your way home by some other means. An enterprising young wizard like you shouldn't have any difficulty in managing a simple thing like that. You got here after all, didn't you? Just apply a bit of the same ingenuity to getting home. Before you can raise any further protest, Theodosius has uttered the spell that will take him back to his manch. In the blink of an eye, he shimmers like a mirage and evaporates away into thin air. As you ponder on possible ways to return home, you remember the document he gave you. You unroll it and discover that it is, it is your diploma, certifying you as a master of wizardry. Ever since you began your study of magic, you have looked forward to the day you would receive this diploma. You roll up the diploma and tuck it into your belt, and square your shoulders and set off back the way you came. As you walk, a sudden thought makes you smile. Teleportation spells are for wimps. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so this is the uh, little, um, it's kind of funny, uh, wizard diploma. Wizard, diploma of wizardry. It looks like it was printed off on a sign and banner maker from the 80s. Diploma of wizardry. On this day, the bearer of the certificate was deemed worthy of the title Adeptus Magicus. Having demonstrated exceptional levels of wisdom, valor, cunning, and sorceress prowess. Henceforth, the bearer is empowered to use spells of all four of the elemental types, earth, air, fire, and water, by order the High Council of Archimages. Is that Mentor Seal? No, it's not. It's a different symbol. It's a Q. Q. I wonder what that's for. And that's with the top of it chopped off, the alchemical symbol of uh, sulfur, implying mind, like mentalism. So anyway, that's what you get. So yeah, we died twice in this adventure, for real, just due to failed dice rolls. But uh, otherwise, pretty good. So that was the end of the story. So even though that's covered with paint, believe it or not, that came covered in paint, uh, that rare novel. But the seller was nice enough to send me a pristine copy. So I guess they had a few lying around. So that was The Screaming Spectre by Dave Morris, Hero Quest novel. The second one that was released, Tyrant's Tomb, which we previously read and got one possible ending. That was book three. This was 93. This is the, like the barbarian story. Um, come on. 93, yeah. So 92, 93. This, I believe, was 91. Fellowship of Four. This one is the longest. 
but it doesn't have a hero an actual hero quest quest in it it just has the narrative story which is kind of cool it's kind of short and short story and then the choose your own adventure game book but this one was 91 yeah so the same year as the second edition of the european hero quest board game and the same year as the pc game and the same year as the north american version of hero quest the one that i no, 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 that was 1990. The North American version came out in 1990, so this was a year later. This is the year of the Japanese version, and this is also the year that the North American versions of Keller's Keep and Return of the Witch Lord came out. See, it's just like all this trivia. I don't know. I just I like sharing it. It's just kind of interesting just seeing the uh, chronology of it all. But yeah, so thanks everybody for listening to the Screaming Spectre and. The stories it contains, so the Screaming Spectre is actually the narrative. And Running the Gauntlet is the name of the solo quest that's in there for the wizard. And then the Beyond the World's Edge is the what we just read, the solitary adventure for a wizard. You can go back to our previous stream and read the introduction. There's uh, the letter. I'll just go ahead and read the letter just so you can remember. So this was the letter that he gave you. It was that message in a bottle. The Citadel of the, the Citadel of the Seven Statues proved more dangerous than I'd anticipated. I have been made a prisoner here and am kept bound in iron chains to prevent any use of sorcery. Fortunately, I've been able to bribe my jeweler, jailer, a hunchback of quite odious habits, and he has provided me with pen and paper. It falls to you, my faithful student, to rescue me. Go to my laboratory, and you will find a magic carpet. Take this with you and ride to the easternmost rim of the world, the brink of the great abyss. There you must command the carpet to convey you across the abyss. You will need spells for your journey. Sure, choose th the spells of three elemental phyla. You have always resisted a good grounding sorcery in this case. I believe your natural inclination to be correct. Many dangers will beset you, and I will trust you to be equal to the task. Do not fail me. Your venerable master Theodosius. P.S. Postscript. I will put this note inside my lucky bottle and throw it into the river that runs beneath the window of my prison. The unique properties of the lucky bottle ought to ensure it is carried down to the sea and thence around the world until it reaches you. This will, incidentally, confirm my theory that there is a sea which encircles the entire world. Or the whole world, rather. An extraordinary document. So that was the story. But yeah, that was uh, in the preview. So yeah, thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. We will be back tomorrow, if all goes well, to play some uh, Hero Quest, the board game, which inspired all this. Uh, but we are playing the Barbarian Quest Pack, the Frozen Horror, Quest 1, the Xanon Pass. Believe it or not, we are only partway through that quest. But finally, after many false starts and many deaths, we have three heroes that are fighting away. And we may only have one or two heroes tomorrow, but we'll see how it goes. And we'll just adapt to compensate. And it should be fun. So thank you. All right. Thanks, everybody. That's going to be the stream for today. Uh, this will eventually go up on XSC3 on YouTube. So until then, everybody be safe. Hope you have a great day, and we'll catch you next time on HeroQuest Fans. Thanks again.